are very proud to present to you the 36th running of this fabled old race, the Southern 500 from Darlington, South Carolina. The weather is 82 degrees, but that's not the big story. It's very hot and muggy, and rain has been threatening all week long. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Larry Nuber, and this is Jack Arut, who will be joining me in the booth this afternoon. You know, when you wander around the grounds here at Darlington, you just can't help but hear the echoes of names like Fireball Roberts and Red Byron, but coming to this race today, there's been one name on the lips of everybody, and that's Elliot. Indeed, Larry. Elliot is the new superstar on the Grand National Circuit, and we've talked a lot about his run for the million-dollar bonus, but there's a couple of issues that Elliot will have to deal with today. One, the Winston Cup Grand National Championship, where he's ahead of his arch-rival Darrell Waltrip by only 138 points. So he's betwixt and between on that issue. Does he run for the million, or does he hold back and conserve and hopefully gain enough points to go for the first Grand National Championship he's ever taken down? Jack, I also think that it's both ironic and fitting that he starts in the front row next to a guy that he grew up watching. You could call David Pearson Mr. Darlington. Ten victories here at this famed old racetrack, three of them in the Southern 500. And what's neat about that is Bill Elliott, when he was growing up, said that his absolute idol in racing was none other than David Pearson. Well, joining us in the pits this week will be the editor of Stock Car Racing Magazine, Dick Bergman, and he is down in the pit area where the Elliots are holding shop right now, and they've had a different approach to the race this week. They sure have, Larry. It's been very calm in the Elliott pit all week. In fact, they've had a separate garage area guarded by uniformed, armed police officers. Press access has been very limited, but don't confuse this calm with disinterest. This team means to win the Southern 500, the Winston Million, and go on to win the Winston Championship. And on the back stretch with another group of stars is Jerry Punch. A Motorsports Hall of Fame here on the back stretch. Names like Foyt, Carter, Yarborough, Allison, and Petty. Many more pitting. A lot of activity here from the back straightaway. Larry? Thank you, Jerry. Well, the program has been picked up just a little bit because Hurricane Elena plus a lot of local bad weather this week is kind of bothering the teams right now. So we're going to the row assignments. Bill Elliott sits on the pole, not a brand new track record. On the outside, the legendary David Pearson. In row number two, Benny Parsons on the inside and Joe Rutman. Bad luck, Joe Rutman on the outside. Row number three, the fifth and sixth position, Dale Hearnart, last week's winner, and Harry Gann on the outside. The fourth row, Darrell Waltrip and Tim Richmond out of Ohio. The fifth row, Terry Labonte, defending champion, and Greg Sachs, winner at Daytona. And in 11th and 12th position, Greg Sachs and... There you go, Ricky Rudd in row six, followed by Tommy Ellis. Row number seven, Phil Parsons and Rusty Wallace. Row number eight. There'll be, of course, 40 cars starting this race. Morgan Shepard getting one of his infrequent Grand National rides, followed by Buddy Baker, Jeff Bodine, Lake Speed. The 10th row, Ron Bouchard, Bobby Hillen Jr. 11th row, Neil Bonnet, Cale Yarborough. Row number 12, Bobby Allison and Richard Petty. The 13th row, Kyle Petty and the legendary A.J. Foyt. Row number 14, Dave Marcus and Tommy Houston out of the late model sportsman ranks. The 15th row, Poncho Carter and Trevor Boys. Row number 16, H.B. Bailey and Ken Schrader. The green flag is anticipated. This pass by, by the front stretch. The 1985 Southern 500 is underway. The entire field of 40 cars passes under Harold Kinder around turn one and turn two. No incidents at this point of the race. This is a treacherous racetrack. And as we become accustomed to see, the red and white number nine of Bill Elliott is the leader. That is Benny Parsons, our broadcasting colleague right now, running in second position. Four hundred and ninety-seven and a half miles to go, Jack. Larry, there's the guy that's going for the million dollars, and he's broken from the point to lead this event by several car lengths over Benny Parsons, who drives in a Chevrolet. There you see the separation as they enter turn three, but look out for number three. Dale Earnhardt is on the move. He broke on the start, and he's going down low, trying to challenge on Benny Parsons as they come across the stripe. Now, remember the significance of this racetrack. Not only is it famous because it was the first of the super speedways constructed way back in 1950, but the myth and the legend of how treacherous this place can be is no myth. This is a racetrack that can jump up and bite you at any time. Look at, at Earnhardt. Every second of the day. And Earnhardt moves underneath Benny. 
Earnhardt took a move down on the inside, a very calculated one as they were going into turn three. He had to make sure he got by sufficiently to give Parsons enough groove to get back in racing speed. But it's Earnhardt moving to second, dropping Parsons back to third. And here's a move on the inside by Tim Richmond as they came across the stripe for a back mark. Tim Richmond, a guy who was set on the pole here, was in sixth position after the last lap. And right now, he's trying to find a way around Darrell Waltrip, the man who has won so many races, including yesterday in NASCAR racing in the past decade. What do you think, Larry? So far, things have gone pretty much as we had expected, with Earnhardt making a move to the front, Elliott dominating at least the first three laps. But it's going to be a shuffle for those other positions, and they round out a turn four. You see the top three, and there's fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth position doing battle. The first interesting moment will come if and when, and it looks like it might happen, Earnhardt catches Bill Elliott. With all this distance to go in this race, will Bill Elliott simply move over and let Dale get by? As we saw last week, when Dale Earnhardt wants to lead, he'll go to any lengths to get it at any time. But you got to remember, this is Darlington, and what a great shot from inside of Benny Parsons' car in third position. There you see him trailing Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt looks to me to be maybe just a tad loose as he comes out of the corners. There's the shot down the front straightaway. See how quick the stripes go by you? A lot of high speed, and then you got to go into that narrow corner and turn one and really just hold on. Benny Parsons Chevrolet, the U.S. Tobacco Copenhagen Chevrolet, who started in third position, giving you these tremendous shots, looking out the back window, down the back stretch. You can see Parsons has an advantage over the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh place running cars as they scoop through turns three and turns four of the treacherous Darlington International Raceway. As you look in the back there, the car that's first on the point, as we look out of Benny Parsons' window, rear view window, is David Pearson. He faded quickly after starting on the pole position, and now he's being relegated back to fourth, and he's got his hands full. There's the battle for fourth, fifth, and sixth. Actually, yeah, fourth, fifth, and sixth. That's Pearson. David, David Pearson dropping off the outside pole, and there's Walter trying to go up on the rear bumper. Is he going to go to the inside, Larry? Indeed, he is in turn three, side by side. David makes way for Daryl here, and here comes Tim Richmond sneaking up there and getting very close to David, and following through is Joe Rutman. That's Joe Rutman in the Folgers number four car, and Harry Gant getting sideways coming off turn number four, still fighting to get it back. You know what's so tough here? You've got to not only race the competition, but the racetrack as well. You've got to pick and choose where you make those passes. That's precisely what Daryl Waltrip, Tim Richmond, and Joe Rutman did when they appropriated that position held by David Pearson. They just looked for the spot and then capitalized, stabbed on it. 1.366 miles around as we look at Daryl Waltrip running easily in the top five. This race equates out to 367 laps. That's 500 miles here in the 1985 Southern 500. You see Dale Earnhardt in the Wrangler Sunshine Yellow and Wrangler Jean Blue number three, closing in on Bill Elliott. Elliott has led this race since the drop of the green flag. Morgan Shepard, whom a lot of people had some positive sentiments about in regards to running well in this race, Jack, is in the pits. That's a big disappointment. Bobby Hawkins has brought out a brand new car, some new machinery. They hoped that they could take a guy like Morgan Shepard, who's run so well at Darlington, and post a top position finish tonight. Today, there's Shepard up in the upper right, but it's not going to be his day in the 36 Southern 500. Look at this battle in the back. Benny, Par actually, that's Benny's little brother in the back there, but it's Ricky Rudd, David Pearson, and Greg Sachs, and then Bill Parsons. But what's happening, and I'm wondering, Larry, is Pearson is dropping dramatically off the pace after a fine qualifying run. David Pearson qualified at almost 156 miles per hour. There's Bill Parsons in the number 66 car. Pearson right now is uh, being posted in 10th position after starting on the outside of Bill Elliott in a twin four to, of course, the full sitting car of Bill Elliott. His speed was 156.6 miles an hour. Rusty Wallace, you see, darting toward that outside cement coming off of turn number four. And now we've got what we thought was coming up, a contest for the lead. Now watch this battle, Larry. We've been watching as it goes around the racetrack, and Elliott seems stronger in this particular area where we're in turns three and four. Earnhardt seems to get the jump coming out of the corner. Well, race traffic may come into play, but he's taking a look to the inside, lap after lap. But watch when we get down into turn number one here. It looks like Earnhardt can't get through this turn just as well. Well, he makes a liar out of me now. Look at that. He goes to the high side and just crawls all over the rear bumper of Bill Elliott. It brings up some interesting race strategy that no other race driver in the history of automobile racing has ever faced. Does Bill Elliott, concerning what's at stake, move over and let Dale go by? 
I don't think so. You're looking at two tough race drivers right there. The new breed taking over here in the 36th annual Southern 500 with Elliott out front. He sees a million dollars in his rearview mirror. And <laughs> when you take a look at Dale Earnhardt, he doesn't care if they're paying five dollars to win or five million. He just races for the front. And we cannot overemphasize Earnhardt. You see smoke in the right rear that time, really whistling her into number one. We can't overemphasize how much every single lap, every turn of the wheel, you are over the edge here at Darlington. It's only a two-lane racetrack at best. Earnhardt is just climbing all over the number nine. He goes to the inside, and look at that. Now, I'll tell you what happened there. Actually, Elliot let him get by. He saw the traffic and said, look, if you're going to run this loose, I'm going to give you the lead. I've got too much at stake, and we're only 15 laps into this thing. Yeah, and he was in a point of the racetrack where the guy on the outside normally has to make way because of the way this particular racetrack is shaped, and that's something you'd have to do no matter if you're running for $1 million or, or $5. Dick? Well, the problem with Morgan Shepard, Larry, is that his car is overheating. The crew says they can't fix it. They're certainly going to have to bring him in. This is no way to start a Southern 500. Bill Elliott leads the race. Dale Earnhardt second. Make that uh, Dale Earnhardt leads the race with uh, Bill Elliott second. Benny Parsons third. Richmond is fourth. Waltrip is fifth. Joe Rutland is in sixth. Harry Gann is seventh. Terry Labonte, the champion, has moved up to eighth. Ricky Rudd ninth. David Pearson tenth. Greg Sachs eleventh. Bill Parsons twelfth. Rusty Wallace thirteenth. Lake Speed fourteenth. Jeff Bodine somewhat of a disappointing 15th at this point in the race but it's early there goes Dale around Pancho Carter the USAC champion from up north but he, and David Pearson has had contact with another race car and slows significantly you on can, the high spot side of the speedway well you can see the wheel marks it block the side of that car and that's something you don't want to get into here at Darlington he'll have to come to the pits for service by his sons I am pretty sure that I just saw Elliot I think go by on the inside digging for safety that was somewhat of a close call for the man going after the million. Here's where you begin to talk to yourself. David Pearson, who is at the tail end of his career, and now he's got to come down into the pit, pit road area, and it's, it's a tough break for Pearson because he wanted to run very well here at Darlington today. David Pearson, who qualified so well, the last time he won here at Darlington was way back in 1980. He won the Trans South 500. David Pearson, the man who many people have called Mr. Darlington, is out of the 1985 Southern Five. A major crash here at the Darlington International Raceway. That is Phil Parsons sitting silently on the inside of turn number four. Phil and Rusty Wallace were the two principals involved in this. They were battling for 12th and 13th positions. Phil Parsons, the younger brother of Benny Parsons, who worked with us yesterday up here in the booth. No movement yet from the car. Both Phil and Rusty made hard wall contact on the outside of turn number four. A lot of debris on the racetrack. No other cars at this point seemingly involved, but you can see some uh, liquid draining from underneath Phil's number 66 skull banded Chevrolet. Phil started this race in 13th position, uh, sitting on the outside. I'm guessing that is Rusty Wallace, and there is still some flame coming from underneath the engine compartment of that car. Now, that's just a guess. There is Rusty. There's another shot of Rusty sitting silently along the outside of turn number four. Here's what's ha what happened as they came off of turn number four. Well, you can see they both got together in the high side there. It looked almost like a rear ender. And from the looks of the skid marks further on back, they were just wedged up there in that old treacherous Darlington high side. But watch the defensive driving there by well, actually, it was Neil Bonnet and Richard Petty. They went to the inside and got by. Well, good news from the pit area. Rusty Wallace, whose car you're looking at right now, is out of the car, apparently in good shape, and he's with our Dick Bergman right now. Very good news. Rusty, you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Everything's just fine. There's no problem there. It's just, uh, you know, NASCAR's trying to get Phil Parsons in. He, he went in to turn real hard and it hit, it hit uh, David Pearson, about knocked them both out of the race. And, uh, his tire was rubbing the right front real real bad. I seen it the whole time. It just kept running. Finally, it blew out and took took me out with it. You know, so I was just a victim of circumstances. And uh, earlier today, NASCAR just says take it easy. You know, if there's any tires rubbing, come on in. But uh, evidently, he didn't do it. He took myself out himself. And so it's a uh, yeah, it's really upsetting trying to run as good as we were running, and this happened. And that was in the drivers' meeting. All the drivers were told that there's a black flag. Come right in. Don't make any guesses. Back to you, Larry. Well, Dick, yesterday afternoon late, Rusty was practicing with Darrell Waltrip and running competitively with him, doing very well. They had high hopes for this race. More good news. Our other pit reporter, Jerry Punch. Jerry, happy to take it down to you because you are with Phil Parsons, Jerry. 
Bill Parsons, uh, a wild ride up in turn four. First of all, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, Jerry. What happened up there? Well, I don't know. I got into Rusty to, you know, pass him for a position, and I think I think that I cut the right front tire down because all of a sudden it popped and the thing just turned right. So I don't know. I hope Rusty missed me. I, I couldn't really tell, but the thing hit the wall a pretty good shot. A lot of flames and a lot of debris. Looks like the car is pretty well used up. Well, it will be for this race anyway. Well, Phil Parsons out of it, but he's okay. Well, it was a very spectacular moment there and some heart stoppers for those of us who know him, and it's good to see both of those guys walking around and talking in good fashion, Jack. Anytime that you see one like that, but we've got a lot going on here at Darlington International Raceway. The 36th Annual Southern 500 will be back with more in a moment. 10-time Darlington winner David Pearson has parked the four. David, what put you out? Well, uh, it blew an engine or something. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm sure it was engine blowed. But, uh, I, you know, I, I, I hate to say it, but kind of halfway glad this one here did something happen here because uh, it seemed like every time we run this motor, it don't ever run real good or something. So, uh, but uh, it just, I don't know. David, you started up front beside Bill Elliott. You had a chance possibly to gauge his strength. Is he as strong as everyone expected early on? He is strong, uh, no doubt about it. But there again, I can't really compare him with my car because, like I said, my car hadn't been running up straight away too good. Uh, it's handling perfect through the corners. I, in fact, uh, qualifying and everything, that uh, people clocking cars through the corner said I was going through the corner faster than even Bill did. But uh, I don't know what it is. It just, just can't get it to going up straight away. Well, the Silver Fox parks it here at Darlington. Back upstairs. The last win for David Pearson in Grand National Competition was here at Darlington in April of 1980. And one of the guys that uh, we've had an opportunity to talk to today has been Cale Yarbrough, and Cale was very close to that accident. Indeed he was. Cale Yarbrough, this is Jack Arood in ESPN Control. You had a good bird's eye view of that crash, didn't you? Well, I saw it as it uh, happened, Jackie. I didn't see what triggered the accident, but uh, yeah, it happened right in front of me, but I did see what started. You started way in the back of the pack, Kale, and you've started again to try and make your way to the front, but somewhat cautiously. How do you assess your chances to get to the front right now? Well, right now we're running fourth place. Uh, I just hope I can move up a little farther and be able to stay there. Uh, the car is not handling just like I'd like for it to, but I hope as the day goes on we can work it out. When you check in the rearview mirror on this restart, you're going to see Million Dollar Bill Elliott. Your thoughts on him? Well, it looks like Bill's running awful good, but uh, it's a long race. Well, we'll stay in contact with you, and good luck to the day. Okay. There is Cale Yarborough following Dale Earnhardt right now. Officially, 27 laps have been completed. Cale is shown in third position. The top six are Bodine, Earnhardt, Yarborough, Elliott, Richmond, Waltrip and Benny Parsons. And let me tell you why that happened. That was some very fast pit work by Jeff Bodine and some of the others. They ducked in, took advantage of that caution period, and got back out. And that's real important at a place like Darlington. Okay, the Southern 500 continues. These drivers run in the entire tracks of some of the most famous names that have ever graced American racetracks. The 1985 version of the Southern 500 is brought to you here on ESPN. Still running under caution flag where Rusty Wallace and Bill Parsons were involved in a spectacular in turn number four. Both drivers A-OK. -okay. Top six, Bodine, Earnhardt, and Cale Yarborough. The first three, fourth through six, Elliott, Richmond, and Waltrip. And by the way, you'll see A.J. Foyt, Super Tech, running up to the top. He has lost a lap, lost a lap underneath all the chicanery of pit stops and the confusion here of the serious yellow flag. Dick Bergen is uh, down in the pit area with an update. Well, unfortunately, Larry, we've got just a tad of rain down here. It doesn't look like a serious situation. Just a heavy, dark cloud passing over the top of us right now, and we're feeling just a little bit of showers. Ronnie Bouchard, meanwhile, has made a couple of unscheduled pit stops. He's having car problems. They're going to try to get him squared away so that he can get back in the race and become competitive. 500 miles, remember. 250 miles on a 1 and 3 eighths mile oval, almost an oval, <laughs> is 183 laps. So. Ernie and Dan Elliott down in the pit area, that's got to be on the front of their minds perhaps more than any other crew here, although everybody wants to win this race. The sentiment this week, in case you were interested, is everybody said, you know, we'd like to see Elliott win. He's come this far, but we are all here to win the race. We're not going to give it to him, but deep down in our heart, if we can't win, we're going to forget. 
know, that's kind of a contrast, too, because for a lot of these drivers, they need to win this race or a race very shortly before the end of the Winston Cup in order to get some more money from their sponsors because Elliott has dominated so much throughout the season. So on one hand, they hope Bill wins. On the other hand, some of these guys like a Yarborough, an Earnhardt, a Walter, they need to win to boost the Andy in 86. Now, remember the cars on the outside row will be the cars on the lead lap headed up by Jeff Bodine, the Levi Garrett, number five. Cars on the inside, including A.J. Foyt, Supertex, and the Gilmore Oldsmobile, number 14, is at least one lap down. Morgan Shepard right there in front on the point. He lost several laps in the pits. Outside row on the lead lap. Getting ready for a restart. Jeff Bodine brings the field around. There is A.J. Foyt. Getting a good look at this guy who runs in this race as a rookie after all those races one in Indy cars, Le Mans winning stock car races, and AJ is definitely off the pace. Green flag. Well, they said AJ would be very, very uh, tentative on the starts here because he said you race the racetrack, not the competition. That's precisely what he did. And look at them rounding out of there. Bodine comes up through the through the throttle in the gearbox very nicely, and he's taking the lead. There's Earnhardt and Yarborough now. A triumvirate hustle down the back stretch. Jeff Bodine, Dale Earnhardt. Kale Yarborough, Bodine still looking for his first win of 1985. The other two guys, they've already won this season. Let's see if Earnhardt tries that move to the inside again that he alluded to a couple of laps before the question. There you can see him waving inside the car. He was waving to Kale Yarborough, and I'm assuming that that was to let him know that he wasn't as badly out of shape as he looked. They're still glued nose to tail as they round out of two and get ready for the run down the backstretch once again. Yarborough looks to the inside. Is he going for second position? There goes Kale Yarbrough, as he has done so many times here at the Darlington International Raceway, beginning to strut his stuff. But that seemed to inspire Earnhardt, and there goes Dale to the inside of Jeff. Earnhardt just taking command of this race, but where is Bill Elliott? There he is at the tail end, and he's starting to close. Yarbrough tries to go to the inside of, of Bodine. Well, a number of races this year, we've seen Jeff Bodine definitely as the hot shoe. He's had the fastest car, seemingly the best setup, and right now, Earnhardt, Yarborough and Elliott look to be running much quicker than Jeff. Let's take a look inside the car, trying to get around Darrell Waltrip as our camera car, the Copenhagen Chevrolet of Benny Parsons. Let's watch him as he works this corner. See what you got to look for. You got to look to the outside, check on Tim Richmond, who's directly in front of Waltrip, sneak a peek to the high side, but you've got to contend with Darrell Waltrip as well. You got to make sure that whatever move you make is telegraphed not only in front, but in behind you as well, because you've got a lot of traffic you've got to contend with see Richmond just wrestling that thing down as he hunkers down into turn number two coming down to the long back stretch you see the new grandstand there to your right breaking up to 165 170 miles an hour about then you slow down going into the long 2500 foot arc of turns three turns four that's a 180 degree corner maybe you slow down to 135 140 miles an hour then re-accelerate coming out of turn number four you'll go around here in about 32 33 seconds average speed above 150 miles an hour you know larry a lot of the drivers are doing signaling from inside the race car when they come across the start finish line they're sticking their hands outside the window to signify that there is rain they're complaining to harold kinder the starter that there's rain on the racetrack and they're questioning why why no caution well, Bill Elliott, as we continue to watch Benny Parsons and his progress, as the yellow flag is out, the yellow flag has come out. We are guessing it is because of inclement weather. The Southern 500 has been temporarily halted here. Benny Parsons holding up his hand to signal the drivers behind. Exactly. He wanted everybody to slow down. Hand signals are very important in Grand National Racing. You don't have brake lights or turn signals. So the best thing you can do is use your hands to let everybody else know what's going on, especially if he's a kind of a semi-teammate like Harry Gant, who Absolutely. runs for Skoll, part of the U.S. Tobacco Brigade. Okay, 35 laps are down. We are a long ways from halfway. As we told you, 183 laps would make up the halfway distance. Benny Parsons, by the way, has dropped way down on the apron of the racetrack. Benny is coming in, I believe, this time around. Apparently something just not perfect to his liking uh, as he sits behind the steering wheel, and Parsons is coming into the pits. There you can see him ducking down to the entrance off of turn number four. The Cal sign there, the big ball that greets all the drivers at most racetracks that they uh, race here on the Grand National Circuit. And Benny Parsons is looking toward Cliff Champion and the rest of the crew as he comes to a stop. What a great right view. Behind. What a great view. This is a driver's eye view of a normal pit stop. See, you get your windshield washed. No work on that. He takes Benny leans over, takes a quick drink, trying to keep himself from getting dehydrated. In the meantime, on the outside of the car, let's take a look. They've taken a check on the tires, exchanged the left side rubber, giving them a little bit of fuel. 
and he's back, but check the windshield. Look at this, he's stopping at the end of pit road and saying, look, and he's stopping in front of Bill, Bill Elliott's crew. crew and saying, I need a quick wipe. He couldn't uh, see. How about that? So somebody from Bill Elliott's crew doing journeyman's duty as he vaults over the pit wall to help a fellow driver, Benny Parsons. A very interesting insight to the camaraderie of uh, Grand National Stock Car Racing. Benny Parsons is now working back up to speed, but it will be a reduced speed as we under caution flag. The best information that we have right now is that this race has been temporarily slowed down because of inclement weather. Still very early in the 1985 Southern 500, Bill Elliott, the man that everybody has been talking about, runs in third place, and he runs in a strong third place. The caution flag, by the way, is going to go away in about a half a lap. It was just a brief shower. We were seeing raindrops on the window up here in the booth. They've gone away, and the sun, as a matter of fact, has peaked through the crowd, cloud one more time. There's the guy directly in front of him running in second position. That, of course, is Cale Yarbrough. Yarbrough, the nemesis of actually Elliott, but look who's directly in front of him. Poncho Carter, Indy 500 pole sitter, a lap down, trying to get it back on the inside. And one tough customer, Dale Earnhardt, leading this 36th annual Southern 500. H.B. Bailey in the red and white number 36, and you caught a glimpse of Eddie Bershwell, the Texan trying to make it as a rookie in Grand National Racing. Green flag this time around. Watch him come up through the gearbox here. The outside row trying to maintain some continuity till they can find a hole and make some passes. Earnhardt does it very nicely to turn one and begins to pull away with Gail Yarbrough and so the rest of the field just tiptoeing lightly through that corner. Yeah, you gotta be a little careful here after a green flag, a resumption of the race after rain because the reason why the race was slowed down was getting a little slippery out there and as Jack pointed out, a lot of the drivers were asking through hand signals, the NASCAR officials, hey, why are we still racing? So everybody's gonna probably feel their way through for the first couple of laps here. Tremendous shot that is. You get a real sensation of the speed. You know, this kind of to envision for yourself if you were driving down a highway, made a left-hand turn, and went into an alley at about 75 miles an hour. You know how close a small back alley is. Well, that's what these guys do when they run Darlington every day, Larry. Particularly at Darlington, because this racetrack is so unusual in its configuration. Yeah, it's a super speedway, and yeah, it's actually paved five lanes wide, but because of the banking, the length of it, and just one of those quirks uh, the way it was built. Here comes Elliott, by the way, looking to the inside of Yarborough. There are only two, about one and a half useful lanes here in Darlington, South Carolina. And Elliott was taking a look at one of those half lanes to see if it was going to be useful to get around Cale Yarborough for that second position. 41 laps down, and so far, Larry, I'm impressed with Bill Elliott. He has run a very heady race, stayed out of trouble, but stayed in that front trio of three, four, or even as back, far back as fifth, but always in contention. There he goes, looking down at the inside. Kale may have just kind of squeezed him a little bit, but Elliott hung tough, gave him a half lane, and then stayed behind him. I don't think there's any question that Bill Elliott is exactly where he would like to be. He wants to get around Yarborough. He does not want Dale to run away and hide. He knows the weather is threatening. He wants to be in a position where he can pass whoever the leader is before lap number 183. If this race is stopped at halfway, the man leading at that point could be, could be, declared the winner. Elliott tries downstairs once again. Yarbrough gives him room. There he goes by very nicely. That is a classic Darlington pass. That's the maneuver you have to execute just perfectly. And that's exactly what Elliott did. When we started today's race, 12 drivers in the race had career wins at Darlington. Parsons, Earnhardt, Waltrip, and Elliott had won Trans-South races. Pearson, Allison, Petty, Gann, and Baker have won both events. And Bonnet, Labonte, and Yarbrough have won Southern 500s also. While you take a look at what was racing up front, let's look a couple of laps ago. You want to see some fantastic driving? Benny Parsons on the outside trying to gather it and see him sawing the wheel back. He's trying to stay off the concrete barrier around the 49 car of Trevor Boys. He lets him get by directly in front of him. Three or four cars get around Lake Speed, and there goes Dave Marcus. But he gathers it back in, and that's how quick you can lose a couple of spots here. Just yeah. one little miscue. Yeah, Jack, and on this racetrack, sometimes like we saw a couple weeks ago when uh, Kale Yarbrough was flogging away at the Michigan International Speedway with an ill-handling group, you can stay in the throttle of a place like Michigan, but at Darlington, you got to get out of it. You just got to give into the race. Track. At the rookie orientation meeting, that's the one point that they hammered home all day. They said, look, if you've got to run as slow as five tenths to one full second slower to stay out of trouble, that's what you need to do. It's 367 laps, and it'll all come out in the wash in the end. But if you try to battle this racetrack and run on the ragged edge, you're not going to be around with 367 laps. 
There's Earnhardt. A good run for Dale Earnhardt. And something that's kind of neat about this car, Larry, Willie Nelson. The rumor is that the Country and Western Hall of Famer is going to get involved with this car because you know that, that deal uh, that they're using, Live Farm Aid. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Listen to this battle for sixth, seventh, and eighth. Here's Darrell Waltrip and uh, Harry Gann. Waltrip, Gann, and Joe Rutman hanging right in there. Rutman in eighth, Gann in seventh, Waltrip in sixth. And as heady of a driver as Waltrip is, he may also be running exactly in the race that he wants, but he knows that all things being equal, he cannot keep up with the torrid pace that Bill Elliott is capable of setting. So Waltrip and Junior Johnson may well be pulling off exactly the race that they want and be in a position where they can charge the last half of this race, be it leading up to lap 183 or leading up to lap 367. Well, so far, Waltrip's run is reminiscent of the one that gave him the victory in yesterday's late model sportsman event. Stay back in about sixth and seventh position, let things thin out, wait until past the halfway mark, and then begin to chip away at the competition, kind of like you would on a giant piece of granite. Harry Gann, of course, the defending winner of this race, a man who won the Southern 500, a goal that every stock car driver in America someday would like to do. There are a lot of legends in stock car racing, legends in terms of individuals and legends in terms of racetracks and races, but the Southern 500, I would venture to guess, looms as the biggest legend of them all. Boy, things have really tightened up in that battle for the third position. Cale Yarbrough holds third. Right behind him is Jeff Bodine, then Tim Richmond, Darrell Waltrip, and Harry Gant like a giant freight train. They rumble down that backstretch, each of them looking for a miscue by Waltrip. Waltrip up on Richmond now. And they're Kale. all waiting to see if Kale will make a miscue, but I look to the inside. Kale is definitely backing up. He was racing with uh, Bill Elliott. You can see the interval there. Elliott is long gone. He's keeping pace with uh, Dale Earnhardt, but Yarborough has been reeled in by Bodine, Richmond, Waltrip, and Gann. It's still early, but these drivers want to feel each other out, especially around this course. Taking a look, the Yarborough tends to run a little higher line than Bodine does, that battle for third position. And every spot counts here, Larry, because when the caution comes out, you want to make sure you've got a clean shot back into the pits, and we'll show you a little bit more about that later. It's so much more difficult to pass here at Darlington than it is any other racetrack probably on the trail. And the future will tell you, as Jack just mentioned, every spot becomes critical because you need to get it now. When the opportunity presents itself, take it. You have to force opportunities. If the opportunities aren't coming your way, you've got to go for them. You have to attack them. Of course, these drivers have become accustomed to that in racing in the 1980s and 1970s in Grand National Racing, but it's even more prevalent here at Darlington. God, you watch those guys. They look like a bunch of precision flying fighter pilots as they circuit around this racetrack. Bodine fans off to the inside, and he may get by the Hardy Chevrolet. He does that time, and he takes over third position. And Richmond trying to follow Jeff through. Waltrip right behind Richmond. Again, they're stuck on the outside temporarily. Where's Waltrip going to go? Waltrip may have enough room. Kale gives him about three quarters of a lane and it may be enough we'll see what happens they come off of turn number Whoa, two side by side you're not supposed to do that coming out of turn two but they did walter on the inside yabra on the outside here we go into into three you're not supposed to do it there either and yabra backed out yabra will have to back out because he has the most precarious lane when they go into turn number three well boy that two was laps <laughs> that'll take your breath away <laughs> very quickly 52 laps have been completed. Darrell Waltrip, who you're looking at right there, has just taken over fifth. There is Bill Elliott, who runs comfortably behind that man right there, the blue and yellow Wrangler car of number three of Dale Earnhardt. The 1985 Southern 500. Right now, Bill Elliott, in his quest for a million, is taking a back seat to this man, Dale Earnhardt. Dale Earnhardt, there you see him in the first yellow car. The number 51 car today is being driven by Slick Johnson at the Johnson Racing Ford. Yarborough goes around to the outside. He is uh, maybe 30 car lengths, 25 car lengths behind Earnhardt. And I've got to say that at this point in the race, Jack, it looks like that Earnhardt is putting it to Elliott. Well, the Chevrolet of Dale Earnhardt is running very nicely. But while you take a look at where, where actually Elliott is running, he's doing the battle plan the way he should have laid it out. But check this battle out. Tim Richmond, oh, yeah, it looks like Greg Sachs hit the wall. Check the body damage when we come around the corner there. Yeah, he's dropping off the pace. Looks like he dented and dinged the right front on that Buick. Well, the Dygard Miller racing machine of Greg Sachs. Gary Nelson, by the way, was on hand this week. He was running in 13th position before this incident, but the man who won the firecracker race at Daytona stunned the racing world. I mean, really stunned the racing world. 
He's not going to be in it for victory today because he's losing laps. You can see what's left of the right front assembly of that race car is dragging on the ground. Greg Sachs coming into the pits and Dick Bergman is standing by and perhaps Dick can update us on the situation with Greg Sachs. Well, Sachs has got some definite right front damage to his car. The inspectors just pointed that the front wheels are not properly aligned. Got the right side jacked up, the right front tire is off. They're going to take a look at it, beat on it a little bit, and see if they can nurse this thing into submission. Sachs obviously not happy behind the wheel. They're going to try to fix it here on pit road if they can. Well, I tell you, this is not a racetrack that you want to have to struggle with an ill-handling car, especially if the handling, the toe-in or the caster or the camber is out. Yeah, this place is just tough enough when the car is handling perfectly. I wouldn't want to be in Greg Sachs' position for the rest of this event. You know, Jack, you do that before the race starts with mathematics and strings and mirrors and all these fancy Dan 1985 style mathematics, some of them computerized. You get into a race, you get to eyeball it. Well, that's the old school, but sometimes it's effective. They're still working there, but Dale Earnhardt is working well out on the racetrack. Taking a look at Earnhardt has slowed the slowed. yellow flag. Dale Earnhardt saw that yellow flag, I guess, before any of us did. Matter of fact, I think he moved over. Very gentlemanly gesture to let Slick Johnson get by. You know what happens there? You're able to hear the NASCAR radios. Each of these crew members down on pit road, they monitor it as Harry Gant pulls into the pits. And I'm sure when they heard Bill Gasaway say, OK, Harold, put it out. Richard Childress went back, and there's a good stop by Harry Gant. But as we were saying, Richard Childress probably told him back out of the throttle. Caution's coming on. Let's see, he's taking on right side rubber. Fairly fast stop, 12.8, not too bad. Reason for the yellow debris from the Greg Sachs incident. Sachs, by the way, is back out of the racetrack. But as is normally the case when something like this occurs, expect him to possibly come in two or three more times, particularly under this yellow flag. Now you slow the field down, and that will give all the safety people around the speedway an opportunity to walk up. Here's, Here comes our leader into the pit, Bill, Bill Elliott, to walk up and get the debris off the speedway. Let's see what they do to Elliott's car. Okay, they're going to change the left side tire. Watch in the monitor and see if there's any movement inside the race car by crew members, because that would be significant. They're changing the handling. They haven't done that. They just put on tires and a full load of fuel. It's a good indication just how well that car's running. Look at this. Beating Earnhardt out of the pits. Let's see, it's not over yet. Earnhardt is accelerating both Bill and Dale, heading up for the banking, trying to get out first. And Bill Elliott, I think, has done it by Joe. <laughs> so Bill Elliott reassumes at least a temporary lead. Of course, it's difficult to tell because all the leaders are going to pit during this yellow flag, but it looks like Bill Elliott may be back out on top because of the strength of this yellow flag. Bill Elliott and Dale Earnhardt with 61 laps completed are ahead of the 36th annual Southern 500 here at the fabled Darlington, South Carolina Speedway. And hello to you and I guess everybody in the crowd watching at home on TV or here at the racetrack would like to say hello to their mother too. There have been about 70 or 80,000 people who have gathered here at the Southern 500 for 1985 to see this man primarily, Million Dollar Bill. Bill Elliott, who has won the Daytona and the Winston 500s. The World 600, of course, went to Darrell Waltrip. Bill Elliott needs to win this race to pick up the bonus $1 million from the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. Elliott established track records at both the races that he won earlier this year. Here are the past Southern 500 winners in the field. You can see Yarborough leads everybody with five, Allison four, Pearson three, and a bunch of people, including Labonte, Bonnet, Buddy Baker, Richard Petty, and Harry Gant, who have won at least once, and all those people are in today's field. Green flag coming up. Harold Kinder looks over the field and flutters the green bunting. Watch Bill out. Let's watch this restart once again. See if anybody tries to make an assault on the front position held down by Bill Elliott. And no, everything seems to go pretty good. Elliott continues to run in front. Earnhardt runs in second. Third, dropping off the pace just a tad, seems to be Jeff Bodine. But with 64 laps completed, it's an Elliott assault on the million dollars still. And we're also going to see exactly how well Dale is running. We told you earlier, it looked like that Dale was laying it on Bill. Well, right now, Bill has the advantage. The question will come at this point of the race, 65 laps in, can Dale catch Bill? First two cars, third, Bodine, fourth, Harry Gant, fifth is Daryl Waltrip. Tim Richmond is in sixth. Joe Rutman, seventh. Cale Yarbrough, eighth. Neil Bonnet, ninth. Terry Labonte, tenth. Showing in 11th position is the car number 49 of Trevor Boys executing a very good pit stop. Bobby Allison is 12th. And the number 15 car, Ricky Rudd, is 13th. Benny Parsons, 14th. And speaking of Benny Parsons, 
There he is. Watch him work this race traffic now. He comes up on Bobby Hill, and it looked like he was just going to gobble up the rear bumper. Bagged out of the throttle a little bit, and he looks like he's fighting the wheel just a tad. He looks to the inside as they come down the start-finish line. He's going to appropriate a couple of positions. He's coming up on the rear bumper of Bobby Allison's car. See how they try to find a space, a slot. As they go into turn one, they want to make it single file. Benny did it very nicely. Well, Trevor Boyce, who we just cited as, as having moved up into the top 15, has slid up and placed on his car a little more than a traditional Darlington strike. We talk about Darlington strikes, but the problem, and it probably occurred to Trevor Boyce, is when you ding it on the outside, you bend that sheet metal in, and it rubs against the tires, and you've got to come down into the pit to pry it back out, or you'll blow a tire. And that's what some of the smoke is coming from Trevor Boyce's car on the outside right now. The Canadian driving the James Hilton Racing Chevrolet, who qualified 30th fastest here this week at uh, Darlington. Now we go back to Benny Parsons. He goes to the high side of Mike Waltrip, the younger brother of Darrell Waltrip, who's qualified for this race. Benny gives a wave to Michael, who has moved over and let the older statesman, one of the older statesmen of NASCAR racing, to slip around on the outside. Some reinforcement for the rookie, too, letting him know he's doing a fine job and just stay out of my way. We're going for it. Who's that directly up in front of Bobby Hill? And when we looked at that shot, he was very loose as he came across the stripe. Could it be? Yes, indeed. It was It was actually, it was uh, Kyle Petty looking like, I mean, Ricky Rudd having some problems. There's Lake Speed behind him. Kyle Petty behind Lake Speed. A good battle and join back there with Benny Parsons. But he'd rather be up in the Yeah, he sure would, Jack. This is 14th and 15th position, and Benny really is running a little better than all these guys. You see Lake, Lake creeping up. There's some tape on the windshield of Lake Speed. Obviously, they have been bullseyed there in the right front of the windshield. Going underneath Bobby Hill, and Parsons is running better than everybody, but he had to make that pit stop prematurely in front of everyone else. Look at this. Cost him Look at this. Position. Three. Kyle tried to go to the inside as they went down into the corner in turn one. You're not supposed to go down on the apron. It hasn't been that way since about 1950, but he <laughs> gave it a stab. 21 degrees is the banking on the turns here at the Darlington. Certainly there are other racetracks that have higher banks on them, but I don't think any more <laughs> more tedious than those here at Darlington. Now here's another view from outside Benny's car, as you can see him orbiting around the 1.366 miles of Darlington. Trying to get around Bobby Allison is the next victim of the onslaught by Benny Parsons, our in-car cameraman. He's going to get it done this lap, but he's just checking him out, trying to measure him up, get ready to set him up and put him down. Benny Parsons is one of the veterans who has never won the Southern 500, and Benny looks to have a number of years to go yet before he hangs up his helmet. This is one race that he would really like to win. We told you at the top of the show that this race onto itself is absolutely critical to the career of every racing driver in their own minds. This is the Southern 500. This is a race that they want to win. Haven't, this missed, much, haven't missed much up front. It's still the Bill Elliott show. He's beginning to pull away from the Dale Earnhardt machine there. You saw a good indication of the separation. And I think we're seeing the answer, Jack. Who has the better equipment, at least at this point in the racetrack, Elliott or Earnhardt, and Bill Schultz? He's beginning to pull away, looking good. Bill Elliott, awesome Bill from Dawsonville. Unassuming Bill Elliott, the man who really wouldn't prefer all this attention. He and brothers Ernie and Dan, what they primarily want to do is go racing. And they are among the new contingent that has moved in and kind of taken the place of some of the old veterans of Grand National Stock Car Racing, and they've done a lot of it on their own. Indeed, it's all been done down in Dawsonville, Georgia, in what doesn't look like much of a race shop. You know, they started building motors in a schoolhouse, but they moved to a little more roomier quarters now, and Elliot, well on his way to a million dollars, forget the bonus, a million dollars in one-year earnings, which would top a NASCAR record that was set by Darrell Waltrip a couple of years ago. So he's having a fine season, irregardless of the million-dollar bonus. Well, without a doubt, Bill's forte has been the super speedways. He has been as close to invincible on the super speedways as any race driver could be this year. Bill Elliott has won all of his races on the super speedways, and with the wins that he has racked up this year, he has won on every super speedway on the Grand National Trail. So Bill Elliott begins to assert himself in the early stages of the Southern 500. Bill Elliott going down the backstretch right now with the lead. He has led the majority of the laps of this race, but he has shared the lead with Dale Earnhardt, who currently runs second. Well, the sensation of the Firecracker 400, Greg Sachs is behind the wall here at Darlington. Greg, what happened? Well, it appeared that we lost a tire going into the first turn there. Uh, the car was working real well after we made a small change. 
And then going into the groove, all of a sudden the rear just come around and seemed like the right rear went down. How is the racetrack right now, Greg? Is it slick? Is it tight? What does it feel like? Well, we felt like when we started the race that we had the car tight enough. But uh, as soon as they dropped the flag, the track was pretty slick. And on the first course, we came in to tighten it up a little bit. Well, Greg Sachs certainly disappointed to be here. He'd rather be out there on the racetrack for sure. Jack, by tightening it up, as we see a change has taken place in second position. Harry Ginn has scooted underneath Dale Earnhardt. Tightening it up means they reach in there, touch those weight jacks, and put more weight into normally the right rear corner of the car. They want to get what they call more bite. And it looks like these two cars have got plenty of bite. Maybe, well, in a way, maybe not enough. Earnhardt trying to get her back around and reappropriate that position that Harry Gant, in his mind, stole from him just a couple of laps ago. Well, Harry Gant was the sixth fastest qualifier, but in practice yesterday, the crew said, hey, we are right. We are exactly where we want to be. And as a matter of fact, with a full load of fuel, we were running maybe closer to our qualifying time than any other team out there. Travis Carter is one of the crew chiefs that's remained very silent and steadfast throughout this week, saying, that, look, we'll be there near the end. Don't count us out of this thing. Right now, he's running a fine race, showing in the second position. But if I was Harry Gant and looked in my rearview mirror and saw Dale Earnhardt, I'd be very cautious what amount of room I give him anywhere around this racetrack because he'll take and capitalize on it. Harry Gant, the strength of this team has been engines, although Harry Gant has really shown that he is an outstanding driver, the Hal Needham Burt Reynolds team. It's one of the finest teams in Grand National Stock Car Racing. The man who won this year's International Race of Champions Championship when he stole it away at the last minute from Darrell Waltrip. Lots of smoke that time, Jeff. You can see they're running a tire smoke. That's just pushing those tires down into the corner and just scrubbing it right off into red hot smoke. Both cars not handling as well as one would hope, at least this early in the race. They'll have to make a couple of chassis adjustments. Taking a look at your leader, Bill Elliott, Trying to get around some lap traffic there. It looks like the 51 of Slip Johnson going another lap to the board. Now watch Elliott when he goes in the corner. Do you see any smoke there? No. A good indication that he's handling nicely. Bill Elliott has obviously won dramatically more races than any other driver in Grand National Racing. After 81 laps, he leads here. He has nine victories so far in 1985. Bernhardt has three. Neil Bonnet has two. And the three of them are the only three drivers who've been able to win more than one. Single winners, Waltrip, Labonte, Gant, Yarborough, and Sachs. The list totals only eight. That is somewhat of a surprise. Normally, we're up around 11 or 12 this time of the season. Here's a good study on race traffic coming up. Oh, A.J. Boyd is on the back pits there, taking on fuel. There, see now, the man on the right side of your screen is jacking wedge, as they say, into the car. You can be sure A.J.'s letting him know, I need more in this Copenhagen Oldsmobile. They've established that. They're cleaning the windshield, and they're getting ready to send him back on his way. Dick Hutchinson, by the way, is his crew chief. And Roger Hamby there in the western hat and the sunglasses, who is, of course, the uh, crew chief for Kenny Reagan. They started this race in 39th position. Talk about a big assignment. There goes A.J. Boyd pulling away. And by the way, he commented to us that we may have missed him at the Pocono IndyCar race a couple weeks ago. Yes, he surprised all of us when he came in the back of the pack and raced into the top ten, was challenging for the top five when something went amiss with the car. But Super Techs from time to time, Jack, definitely shows us that he still has it beyond a shadow of any doubt. No question about that, but look at the question here. It's a battle for position. Cale Yarbrough ducks to the inside in turn three, gets around Tim Richmond to take over a position. And that's a good example of how you have to pass when you come through a corner. You've got to look to the inside. You can't go to the high side. Cale Yarbrough has moved into six. For those of you who follow Grand National Racing regularly, here by car number only, top 10, 9, 33, 3, 5, 11th is 5th, 28, 27, who we just saw, 12, Four and 15. Ricky Rudd holding on to the number 10 position. All those guys, including about five or six others, huh, make that 12 others on the lead lap. 22 cars remain on the lead lap. And I am surprised. That's rather impressive with the pace that Bill Elliott and Dale Bernhardt have set today. That many guys have run that quick, Jack. Well, if you look at Yarbrough taking a look at Bonnet and Joe Rutman. Rutman looked to the inside, but had nothing to do with it. He wasn't able to take the position there. Bonnet being shown in the eighth spot. Rutman back in ninth, and he's working over that Budweiser Chevrolet, hopefully for a position. Well, Neil Bonnet, who has won at Rockingham, won at North Carolina this year, is a man who came into the season with very high hopes. He and the crew really felt that they would be a true contender for the championship. They had some problems in qualifying this week. 
came with a car that wasn't exactly experimental, but it wasn't the tried and true formula. They went home after the first day of qualifying this week and came back with an older car, perhaps a car that's got a few more miles on it. Tim Brewer, the crew chief, and Neil put it together, and they were the fastest qualifier the second day. When I asked them why they sent the car home, Tim Brewer said that dog just wouldn't hunt. <laughs> well, that's part of the folklore of people who live in the Deep South. Hunting is a big part of their life, the outdoors life. I think we mentioned at the top of yesterday's show, they have their own diet down here. Grips are really big. You order iced tea at a restaurant, you gotta ask for unsweetened iced tea because up north you get it with, when it's not unsweet, you don't have to ask for it. But down here in the south, you gotta make special effort. Jerry Punch right now is down in the pits and he'll update us on the Dale Earnhardt situation. Richard Childers is the car owner for Dale Earnhardt. Richard, is there a handling problem with the car? Yeah, we tightened the car up with the tires last time and we just got it a little too tight. Now we'll make some adjustments on the next stop. The car apparently pushing, he's having an awful hard time turning the car out of turn four. Now that's where he's losing all his time now. The car just won't cut on him and he's trying to make it. Better. On that last pit stop, they changed right side tires here in the Earnhardt pit. Everyone else changed left side tires, thus Earnhardt having a handling problem. Well, we mentioned a little bit ago the how limited the list of winners so far this has been, so far this year has been. There have only been six people who have been fast qualifiers. You know, when Richard Childress was addressing that and saying that Earnhardt was complaining that the car wouldn't cut coming out of the corner, that is why you're seeing that tire smoke, because when the car starts to come around, it just digs into the pavement, compresses the rear tire, and spins the rubber right off of those Goodyears. Well, among those four winners, Earnhardt is one of them. Elliott has 10, Waltrip four, Labonte two, and Bonnet again, along with uh, Dale, have picked up one each. So Bill Elliott, the quest for the one million dollars. Will he break the community chest? Will Bill pass go and earn one million dollars from the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company? Right now he looks very strong. Richmond, Bonnet, and Rutman, the three red cars going at it in the top ten. No matter, no matter where you look around this racetrack, Larry, there's a good race. Take a look at all of this. Here's, here's Rutman and Bonnet and in front of them, Richmond, and they continue to go at it. That's one of the unique things about Darlington. Wherever you look, there's a good battle. Well, a part of our broadcast that have been very well received in all the years that we have been doing auto racing on ESPN have been our track backs. As we told you earlier in the show, that ESPN is now entering its seventh season this weekend as your number one auto racing network. Everyone is familiar with the aerodynamic work that's been done on Grand National cars to get them to cut through the wind and go faster in the race itself. But the new trend in aerodynamics is to even worry about how the air flows to the engine. And many of the competitors have begun to use a gauge that monitors air flow off the body of the car into the air cleaner and into the motor. This track back has been brought to you by the Levi Garrett Chewing Tobacco Company. Time after time, the quality comes through. 92 laps are now complete. Bill Elliott continues to lead this race. Harry Gann is second, followed by Dale Earnhardt, Jeff Bodine, Darrell Waltrip, and Cale Yarbrough. Back to the Southern 500 after this. You're looking at a relaxed Ernie Elliott standing under an umbrella. You think he's at the beach on a Sunday afternoon rather than trying to win a million dollars. But Ernie, are you concerned about the pace that Bill is setting early on? No, we're not running too hard right now. Okay, we got problems. We got problems, H and Ernie Elliott and the crew are going to have to get busy with the crash on the speedway. And we'll move back out of the Coors pit. It was a tire that went away. I heard it, Jack. It's H.B. Bailey. And boy, this is just another installment in a litany of bad crashes for this gentleman from Houston, Texas. He walloped the inside retaining wall just a couple of times. I think it was last race here in the Southern 500. Score another one for H.B., a DNF, and a torn up race car. He's moving inside the race car. At least he looks that way. Yeah, he just picked it, put his hand up to the to the seat belts, trying to uncinch them. So it looks like he's at least tentatively right now going to be listed as okay. But look at the damage that that concrete barrier can do to a Pontiac. Yeah, HB who picks and chooses carefully. He's a businessman from down in Texas. He doesn't run every race on the trail, but he he likes to come to these places that have legends associated with them. And he's a member of the very exclusive Darlington Unical Record Club here. He once qualified the brand of car that he was driving that year as the fastest. And HB likes to come here and rub shoulders with all the Grand National guys. Okay, Harry Gant is the first of the leaders in and out of the pit. We're still away 
waiting. There's Dale Earnhardt. He's in as well. Let's go down to Jerry Punch because it looks as if Bill Elliott is getting ready to make his run. Elliott is working his way right out of the uh, backstretch now. And let's go to Jerry. Bill Elliott brings the cars forward. Now Pitt Road here, Junior Johnson standing right in front of the Elliott pit waiting for his driver, one of the Budweiser cars. Elliott just about gets clipped as Joe Rutman moves in front of him. The chorus crew will go to work on the Elliott car. He looks extremely relaxed inside the car. They will jack the right side. You see two right side tires will go on the car. Routine pit stop. They're only allowed two tires under caution. That's the NASCAR rule. They have it full of fuel. They've come back across. They are going to jack some wedge. They're changing the weight. Ernie in the back of the car. Good, good stop, a little over 16 seconds. Good stop, even under caution for the Elliott. He is held up at the end of pit row, but only momentarily. Earnhardt is screaming around the racetrack, trying to get out in front of Bill, and he does so. Dale Earnhardt passes Bill Elliott under yellow flag, and Elliott is once again relegated to second. You know, Larry, the guy that actually, well, look at that. Here's H.B. Bailey coming out of the car. Maybe we were a tad premature. No, he's moving. It looks like he just needed some help out. The rescue crews have gone to his assistance. And we'll see if he can make his way down that banking to the uh, service personnel that are awaiting him. Yeah, if you're a little woozy, that's a job in itself. I mean, we are talking about a 21-degree bank here. And as you can see, it walks you down the bank by yourself if you're not careful. Well, he's going to the ambulance now. And there's Tommy Ellis coming in for some some quick work, a good run by this late model sportsman competitor. You know, they're trying to make a concerted effort to go after the Winston Cup Grand National Tour full-time next year. They got in the middle. And what a unique paint job. Look at that red, white, blue, star-spangled for Tommy Ellis. <laughs> All-American Tommy, the Friedlander Chevrolet. He qualified well this week here at Darlington. He was the 12th fastest qualifier. He was above 154 and a half miles per hour. So Ellis had a good place to start this race from. And he's run very steady, about in 15th position uh, in the, this year's Southern 500 race. Well, Bill Elliott has been besieged by press people. He's been guarded by a couple of State Highway Patrol people all week long. So we took our Benny Parsons to a little more pastoral setting with Bill. Hello, everyone. We wanted the opportunity to talk to Bill Elliott, and we wanted to get him away from the racetrack, away from the hustle and bustle. And I think we found the perfect spot. The Florence Country Club, as you can see in the background, it is beautiful out here. Uh, it's dusk, and I think that uh, we're as relaxed as we're going to be. And Bill, thanks for coming out with us tonight. Good to be here. It's been a good year, hasn't it? Well, no doubt about it. Just like I said today, I feel like no matter what happens from this point on, we've had a good year. Uh, went 1983, November 1983, you won your first Grand National race? Right. Riverside. Riverside, California. How many races did you win in 84? Grand Three. National. Three Winston Cup races in 84. And this year you absolutely just almost dominated the sport. What? How? <laughs> People ask you how. I feel like that, you know, even at the end of last year, we had things starting to come together. We started running good everywhere we went. We were finishing races. We were doing extremely well in the races. And I feel like just experience from all sides, my experience of finally figuring out what I wanted out of the car, Ernie's experience with the engines and them staying together and such a good job that he does, and all the people back at the shop, their experience of knowing what to look for on the race car and knowing what to check and, and things of that sort and knowing, reading the situations as they come along during the race. I feel like that's been more of a key than anything else. You know, you, you got an opportunity. You had an opportunity for a couple of months now to win a million dollars. How have you been able to handle all the media attention? I mean, there's newspaper writers and TV people crawling all over you. Well, so in some aspect, I know uh, maybe I got a little short on some of the stuff, but yet I try to deal with it the best I could at the time. You know, and but that is something that comes with experience, and I feel like now I'm more prepared to deal with it because I've been through it. Plus, how many other people have ever been put in the position I was put in? You know, I mean, I realize it's very difficult, but do you guys really think about the million dollars? Well, I feel like we've done everything we can do to the car as far as preparing it for this race. I feel like we had another shot at it to World 600, and things didn't work out. We had some, I guess that was the worst weekend of my life or worst week, the way the circumstances went that weekend. Uh, 
Uh, we went, ran the Winston on Saturday. We didn't run good at all in it. The car was jumping out of gear, and I feel like we just weren't prepared for that weekend. Because of Sunday? Because of Sunday. And Saturday's we, race suffered because of Sunday. Right, because we were trying to concentrate on Sunday's race. And then Sunday came along, and we just had a had a wheel that had a little bit of weld in it that was protruded in, and it rubbed a hole in the little brake line between the calipers. And that's all that happened. It's something that you could check the rest of your life things on a race car, and that's something that you'd never check or never even think about. So you had no brakes on the race? Uh, then during the race, I ran out of brakes and had to end up fixing that. It really, you know, really hurt us a lot. But, you know, then coming into here, I feel like things are so much more relaxed and so much more at ease. You know, I felt like if a race paid $10 or a million dollars, I'm going to approach it the same way. Slow talking and red hot driving Bill Elliott, the man who has a chance for R.J. Reynolds' million dollars today here at Darlington. Well, the top six at this point, Gant, Bodine, Dale Earnhardt, number nine of Bill Elliott, Daryl Waltrip, and Cale Yarborough. Fifteen cars have remained on the lead lap. We have officially recorded 104 laps of the scheduled 367 of this race. Uh, the average speed 122, almost 123 miles an hour after 100 laps. The race record is 134 miles an hour. Caution flags are seemingly a way of life at Darlington. Taking a look at Tim Richmond there in car 27, he's having a leisurely afternoon. Larry, why don't you check in and see how he likes his Sunday drive. Uh, Tim Richmond, this is Larry Newber up at ESPN Control. Uh, right now, you guys are embroiled in just a touch of controversy, aren't you? Uh, I guess you could say that, Larry. I don't really know what's going on. You take the caution, uh, you go by, you know, take the caution flag, and come in when you're supposed to, and you come out here, and you're in this situation. I don't know what's going on. I, I wish they'd fix it. Uh, somehow or another, we, uh, we should not be in this situation. Uh, whoever's fault it is, uh, we need to find out. Tim, you have been a real threat for the top five positions, though, when under green, the car looks like it's working pretty good. How's it feel inside the cockpit? Ah, it feels all right. The little car's uh, a little tight right now. Uh, other than that, uh, we're having a little problem getting off of two and running down the back straightaway, but uh, now we're doing pretty good. Tim, stay with it, and uh, good luck on the situation. We hope it gets solved to your crew's satisfaction. Thanks, Tim. Thank you very much. Let's explain the situation that Tim Richmond alluded to. When the caution was displayed for the H.B. Bailey crash, Tim Richmond and Joe Rutman allegedly, and I repeat allegedly, ducked onto pit road too soon. So what that did is very similar to what happened in Bristol, Tennessee a week ago with Darrell Waltrip. They weren't, uh, they weren't given the opportunity to catch up to the tail end of the lap leaders. So therefore, they're being considered now on the tail end of the lap directly in front of the current leader of this race, and that's Harry Gant, but in danger of going a lap down when they drop the green flag. We have had eight lead changes among seven drivers so far in the race today. Among those who has led a lap under caution flag, Bobby Hillen, that number eight there, that bright yellow and black red trim number eight, whose father, Bobby Hillen Sr., usually watches these broadcasts. And Bobby Sr., your young man, has picked up five extra points today for leading a lap here in the Southern 500. Boy, that sounds exciting for a young man like that who just a couple years ago was a Texas prep high school star. It's so difficult on a restart like this to cancel out all of the controversy and the feelings that you may have with the likes of a Joe Rutman and a Tim Richmond, knowing that they feel they should be in the back. They've got to get ready to come up through the gearbox and hold off the leader, Harry Gant, or they will go a lap down, and all the arguing in the world isn't going to do it. There's a good look at Richard Petty. He's mired down there in the lapped car brigade on the inside. Going around him is your leader, Harry Gant. Northward, looking up skyward, looking for the green flag. The green flag is out in Ruffin and Richmond now enter a period of this race with only 107 laps down, where every lap is the white flag lap for them. They know they have to stay ahead of Harry Gant if it's at all possible. Ahead of Harry Gant, Dale Yarbrough, Bill Elliott, all the other top runners because they are almost one lap down, and that is one of the marks of excellence in Grand National Racing. If you are to have a shot at winning a race, the trick is to stay at all costs on the lead lap at any point during the contest. Well, we've given you the version as the way that Joe Rutman 
Richmond, and Tim Richmond are viewing this possibility. But here again, on the other hand, wants desperately to put them a lap down. Again, goes to the inside of Richmond, takes a look, thinks better of it, going into turn one, because then he can just cancel them out of his competition column for the lead and for a possible win here in the Southern 500. Both Rutman and Batman Richmond in the red old gold number 27, whom Harry Gann is putting it to right now. Ran well in the late model sportsman race yesterday. Watch Richmond try and come back. He uses the crossover, goes to the inside of Harry, squeezes Harry up along the wall. Both of them fight the wheel coming out of turn number four. Harry slides just a little bit. He loses control just for a split second, but it's enough to hold back Tim Richmond. Well, Richmond tried to do the bob and weave, but Harry said, uh-uh, nothing doing, fella. You're one lap down. I put you away. Now I'm going after Rutman. Both Richmond and Rutman looked like potential winners at certain times during the sportsman race yesterday, but both were put out after shunts here on this old fame lady in black. So much talk early on, and we, we alluded to how well Bill Elliott was running. Well, let's take a look at a couple of other fellas that seem to be doing a good job today. Ricky Rudd, and there's a view of Rudd's car from inside of Benny Parsons. The Ford Thunderbird from the Bud Moore stable beginning to show some promise here as we reach 110 laps. Benny Parsons looks at his rear bump, rear deck lid, and he sees Terry Labonte, the defending Winston Cup Grand National Champion. All those guys still in the lead lap. Labonte in the sky blue Piedmont Airlines number 44. Ricky Rudd in the motorcraft car and Benny Parsons in the Coke car. They run in the lead lap. There comes Buddy Baker moving to the inside. Baker also on the lead lap. He's in 11th position, Jack. Buddy Baker has had one of those up and down kind of seasons. You know, he and Robert Harrington are the Coke car runners on there. The car the first time that that Baker has been a car owner, running his own operation. And directly behind him, the troubled plague, Valvoline Buist of Ron Bouchard. And Dick Bergeron has got an update on the condition of Ron Bouchard. Let's go down to him on pit road. Well, Jack, he's really been having some problems with that car today. The most recent problems are front end damage. And the crew brought him in four times here recently to tape up the front end. Car owner Jack Beebe said that as a result of that front end damage, they lost a full up for that by taping the nose of the car, and that's why it's got such a, such a funny-looking nose. Well, Buddy Baker, who runs right behind that funny-looking nose car, the number 47 Valvoline car of Bouchard, he was a man who has been acknowledged through his career as one of the experts on the super speedways. He has not won here at Darlington, however, since 1971. Look at Wild Bill Elliott, million-dollar Bill, trying to make his way back to the front position. He's being posted in the ninth spot, but he's going to try and get around Jeff Bodine and take over that fourth, take over the third spot that Bodine holds down as they went across the stripe. And there's Richmond in danger of going further in the back of the pack. Jeff Bodine battling for the top spots right now would really like to do well here at Richmond, or rather at Darlington. He has not had the best of seasons the past three races. He has dropped out of the last three races in a row. Jeff Bodine, the number five car. Well, Bodine is still nursing that sore shoulder that he received in that terrific crash in Talladega, Alabama. He seems to be running very nicely. Boy, that was a close call going around Richmond for both Bodine and Elliott. Look who took a little learning there. Bobby Hill and just glued to the rear deck, lead, got around along with Bill Elliott, got around Tim Richmond. Even though Bodine's had a disappointing season, you know what? He is ranked fifth in terms of the most money won in 1985, even despite not winning. He's won over $336,000. Let's take a look at this Tim Richmond potential incident. Going out of turn number four, here's Bodine on the inside. Elliott follows him. Wow, he just wow. taps the wall. Richmond does on the outside. Elliott takes some averted action, some defensive driving, ducks to the inside, and look, super Tex back on pit road. A.J. Boyd is not without wins in Grand National competition. He has won seven times in this type of racing. He picks and chooses his races very carefully now, and he's told you many times he's a rookie here at Darlington. Look at the battle for the lead. Dale Earnhardt, Harry Gant going after it right now with 115 laps completed. Earnhardt looks as if he's taken over that front position away from Harry Gant. But Gant wants nothing to do with that. He's going to stay right tight and work through that race traffic. And look at Ruttman, he's yet to go a lap down. Ruttman is still on the tail end of that lead lap. Boy, it's like being in the middle of an arm wrestling match and you're getting down to the end of the table but you just won't give up. Joe Ruttman trying to hold on. Harry Gant running in second. But Earnhardt is getting ready to try and put Joe Ruttman officially one lap down. 
There's Cale Yarbrough's Hardy Sport Thunderbird. A lot of people felt that this was going to be a season of continuation of the domination that they had on their limited schedule when they ran a Chevrolet. They elected to go to Ford this year, and it's just been a litany of bad luck with problems with that Ford Thunderbird. Another driver that's moved over to Thunderbird Power is Bobby Allison. The hood's up on that. That's not a good sign for Allison and his team. Bobby Allison, one of the top five drivers ranked in terms of all-time career wins in Grand National Stock Car Racing, watches as Daryl Waltrip, whom he has raced many times, his teammate, Neil Bonnet, continue to rocket around this old racetrack. Daryl Waltrip still very much in it for this win. Bonnet also on the lead lap. Waltrip is sixth, and Bonnet is seventh right now. You know, there's so much racing left to go that a lot of what we're looking at here could be conceived and perceived as just sparring, just testing each other out. All of the drivers will tell you that it really makes no sense to run away and hide here at Darlington because it can change so quickly, and it really doesn't count until about lap 300 to lap 367. That's when they take off the boxing gloves and go bare-fisted like John L. Sullivan used to. Well, Darrell Waltrip is a man who we have seen run on all types of racetracks and run well. You know, this Grand National Trail goes from super speedways to short tracks to road courses, and Waltrip has been almost uncanny in his ability to perform well on all kinds of racetracks. And it raises an interesting question about Darlington. Is this racetrack, because of its length, a super speedway, because of its shape, a short track? This is not a super speedway here. This is a super survival racetrack. You don't have to uh, do anything here other than use your head. Uh, you don't have to be fast. I, I want to race the sportsman race. I didn't have the fastest car, but I tried to pick and choose where I wanted to pass people and find myself where I need to be when the race is over. That's what you got to do here. You may not hear about Darrell Walker all day long. I may sit there all day long and run in 10, but when it comes inside that last 100 miles, I hope to see car 11 eating the rear end out of that car number nine, because that's the guy you got to chase. Well, that's basically what we've said so far, Jeff. Precisely my point. All of these drivers will tell you time and time again, the most difficult thing that they've got to do is try and hold back, retain their enthusiasm to the last couple of laps, Larry. That's when it really counts. Not all this right now. So Darrell Waltrip is still one of the people to watch. 65 times that he has won a race, he's ranked fifth on the all-time win list. Waltrip, Bonnet continue their pace in sixth and seventh position. Directly ahead of them, the number 28 of Cale Yarbrough and the number nine of Bill Elliott. Well, Junior Johnson, whose cars are very prominent on the Grand National Stock Car Trail, never won this race, but he finished second back in 1962 to Larry Frank when Junior was driving a Pontiac. But his Chevys, there they are in the racetrack, they are performing about the way they always do at a Grand National Stock Car race, and that as well. Jerry Punch is with Junior right now. Junior Johnson standing here on the pit wall. Junior, your cars appear to be running awfully strong, but they're not being punished. Is that the strategy? Well, this place here is so hard to get a car to run here all day long without getting in the wall or something. Things just really get started. It'll be a long time yet before we really get after our cars. So if you get after them right now, it only means you're gambling on tearing them up before you know you get out to the end. So we're just going to sit back where we at for a while. They're going to bide their time here in the Budweiser pits. Meanwhile, further up pit road in the old Milwaukee pits is Dick Berger. Not sure who is pre for Tim Richmond. Barry, where do you think you're running? Is there a scoring problem with your car? yesterday for a great amount of it until eventually he crashed out of it. Today he's having handling problems and they're also having some scoring problems as well. 
know, Larry, we took a look before we went to the interview with Junior Johnson, and Daryl Waltrip and Neil Bonnet were running nose to tail. They were coming up on some lap traffic. Now, watch the hand signaling that goes on here and how important it is. On the inside, Daryl points to the inside saying, look, I'm trying to make a hole to get around Lake Speed, the lap car, Clark Wire, and signaling back was his teammate, and that, of course, was Neil Bonnet saying, okay, buddy, if you're going to go there, I'll follow you, too. Yeah, very, very grabby. It looked like that Daryl had ideas of moving to the inside, but the first corner popped up too quick. And you got to turn left there, don't you? Yeah, I think so. But what he was also doing, too, not only signaling to uh, his teammate, Neil Bonnet, but he was also letting Clark Dwyer know, look, I'm trying to get to the inside. Give me a little room. So they are coming down the front stretch again. A.J. Boyd directly in front of them. They move to the high side of another Midwestern dirt tracker, at least originally Kenny Schrader, a guy who still ventures north on weekends off in Grand National Racing and is winning midget races. There they go to the high side of A.J., and A.J. moves over and lets the Johnson cars go through. You know, you talk about A.J. Foyt, normally you'd want to see him up there running for the victory, but you've got to put some kudos on A.J. today. He's got the yellow bumper, and he's doing precisely what any rookie at Darlington should do. Learn about the racetrack, try to finish 500 miles, come back and race for the victory the next time you're in the 36th annual, 37th annual Southern 500. I know when I go through the record book that Foyt has never raced here, but somehow the words are just not congruous. Foyt and rookie just don't fit. I think I want to say it's Foyt's first time here and leave the rookie stand. Is off. Rookie, <laughs> by any other name, is still a rookie, and that is what A.J. Foyt is. That's what he maintained all through the week here. Right straight through rookie orientation, everything that had to go on here, A.J. maintained the decor of the first time. And he has won the Daytona 500, as you saw on the screen, his last win in Grand National Competition way back in 1972, but not an indication of how well he has run in certain selected races. He just hasn't run that many times. Now he takes Bobby Hillen, a fellow Texan, right down into the gray matter down there, and Hillen has to fight and scratch and claw to get back in the groove. Hillen's going to the high side of A.J. this time. Lake Speed powered by on the high side of A.J. Floyd. Ricky Rudd. Ricky Rudd has stayed on the lead lap. He runs in eighth position right now. Lake Speed has dropped one lap down to the leader. They go around the number 51 car being driven by Slick Johnson of this week. You see Speed and Rudd and Ron Bouchard right behind. They're running together on the racetrack right now, but Ricky Rudd is the guy who's been able to keep pace with the leaders, primarily Gant, Elliott, and Earnhardt. He has stayed on the lead lap, executed some perfect pit stops, and Ricky Rudd still runs in a potentially competitive position. Well, you heard Junior Johnson say, look, it's important to just stay in the lead lap. We'll do our adjusting and our racing later on. Bud Moore's been around here for a number of years, the car owner, chief mechanic on Ricky Rudd's car. And you can be sure that that's the same advice he gave to his driver. Tim Richmond moves underneath the man who has finished in the top 10 10 times this year, the number 75 car, the nationwide auto parts special of Lake Speed, the guy who finished second in this year's Daytona 500. to Darlington here in 1985 as a rookie, as we told you, but a lot of people still go to him for some reflections on how to drive a race car, but he was in the unusual position of being on the opposite end of the stick this week here at Darlington. When NASCAR called their rookie meeting together here at Darlington, it didn't matter what your credentials were. Whether you were the only four-time Indy 500 winner like A.J. Foyt or this year's Indy pole sitter like Poncho Carter, you were a rookie, exactly like Ken Schrader and exactly like Mike Waltrip because you had never driven in the Southern 500. Ricky Rudd presented an educational video to the assembled group, complete with tips on passing and defensive driving. Then he and Neil Bonnet drove home their own points. The main thing to remember here, during, during the race situation here, it's... It looks like it's two lanes wide. It's actually a one groove racetrack. And any time you're on the bottom of the racetrack, you're actually in a racing groove. Regardless if you're trying to get out of the way or you're not, uh, or intentionally, you're actually in a racing groove. So, you know, the other cars got to make arrangements to get around you. And like Ricky said, it's we're asking you guys to do the hardest thing that when you first time here is to stay out of the way. If your car is running up front with a leader, you know, more power to you, jump out there and expect the other guy to treat you the same way. But if you're in the inside, they're asking you probably to run 20, 30 miles an hour slower sometimes than you think you should because you're gonna slide in front of those cars and there's nothing they can do but run over you. Then it's back straight away, even in practice. If you're out there practicing or when this race gets going or whatever, don't hesitate down that back straight away. If you're halfway down, you said lead car coming, if you motion him by, you need to that's the only way to communicate all day long. Motion that car by. If you make that commitment, tell him to go by, if you gotta drop back or let that car on the rent. When the meeting adjourned, Rudd explained why veterans like Carter and Foyt paid so much attention. 
Well, you know, those guys, they're winning race car drivers. They, they, come, they didn't come to Darlington to just try to be here. They came here to try to want to win races, and I think they're probably trying to pay attention as close as they can to uh, any tip that might help them win. And I say, whatever it takes for them guys to win, they're going to they're gonna look after and try to do. And I feel like if the situation was re reversed, if I was over in Indy, I'd be totally lost. And uh, I'd, be, I'd be listening to everything anybody had to tell me that could help me out, help me run better. The responsibility of instructing the rookies all season long has belonged to that man right there, Ricky Rudd. And they passed the torch Thursday night. And Neil Bonham, who you also saw on that piece and saw a wave a few laps ago, is the new rookie instructor. And any of the rookies will tell you just how important it is to go through rookie orientation at each and every racetrack they run at. One of the rookies, former rookie of the year, is right behind Rudd. That, of course, is uh, the uh, Ron Bouchard machine of Buick. And when you look at the front end of that car, one of the good things about it, uh, Larry, is the fact that at this racetrack, it's not as critical as some others to have to run fast. You know, you can just leave all that duct tape on there, and it's not going to sacrifice all that much speed in a place like Darlington, or effectiveness, and for that matter. That uh, race for position, they run in eighth and ninth right now on the lead lap. Twelve cars on the lead lap with the leader. And by the way, the leading rookie so far in 1985 is Ken Schrader. Back up front as we look at Dale Earnhardt still running in the front position. In front position, I was going to say. I thought that Dan had taken some of what of an advantage, but Earnhardt has moved back around Harry. Harry runs in second, and Bill Elliott is dropped down to fourth position as Jeff Bodine is snuck in there. This is that period, Larry, where you go through the race where everything stabilizes for a moment. Everybody settles in for a long afternoon. 143 laps completed, and they're just waiting for that 350 or 360 mark. Well, Dale Earnhardt hopes to join people like Monty Flock, Hurst Thomas, and Johnny Mance, and Curtis Turner, guys who won the Southern 500 in the early stages of their career. time and look at the smoke just pouring off that right front tire and the windshield is just taking a heck of a hit and the caution is displayed and I'm sure it's for the boys incident. 147 laps down and a lot of the leaders came in about 40 laps or so ago so depending upon how the setup is going uh, could we expect them to come in Jack? Well at this point all of the leaders should come in because you'll want to take advantage of making tire exchanges you know you've only can change two tires during a caution Whenever you get that advantage, you want to duck on a pit road and take on some new rubber, either left sides or right sides, depending on which are most needed. The pace car is right now exiting pit road. Here come all the leaders. There's Earnhardt coming down pit road. Uh, Harry Gann is right be behind him, and Jerry Bunch is right there. Play Monte Carlo for Dale Earnhardt comes to a halt. The leader will get right side tires. A problem a few minutes ago when one of the other cars, Lake Speed, has stopped. They had a blistered left rear tire. A lot of crews are concerned about the tire wear here now. I think a good look at these right side tires on Earnhardt's car. Two right side tires. Fuel, he's down and away. 14.3 seconds of super pit stop for Richard Childers' crew for Dale Earnhardt. And look at Harry Gant. Gant just snuck to the inside of Earnhardt and tried to take the front position. He came up through the gearbox. I thought I was at Bristol, Tennessee at a drag race instead of here at Darlington. Well, you can see the number 49 car, Trevor Boys, was still sitting on the inside of turn one. There's Ricky Rudd. He's been on the lead lap but having trouble getting it refired. Now it kicks underway under its own power and Rudd returns back to the battle. Bill Elliott also executed a pit stop during this yellow flag session and Elliott got out about in third or fourth position. 148 laps complete. Now, if Bill Elliott has anything left, expect to see it right now because we are approaching the halfway point of this race. Green flag is back out at Darlington, South Carolina. Dale Earnhardt is at the point of the pack again. Earnhardt dives down into turn number one on this old oval. And Dale Earnhardt is the leader of the pack and the leader of this race. Harry Gant runs in second. Jeff Bodine motors in third. Moving Bodine up to third, and there's the lead trio, but actually that car of Lake Speed is a lap or several laps down. It's Earnhardt out front and Gant running second. Now Gant's going to have to figure out a way to get around speed before he can do battle for that front position. He ducks to the inside as we come through our speed shot. You got him, Larry. Over 30 cars remain active in this race. Lots of heavy duty, heavy metal, and heavy traffic out there for the Southern 500 of this year. Earnhardt leads it, followed by Gant. We mentioned Bodine, Cale Yarbrough is fourth, Bill Elliott is fifth, Walker of the sixth, and Neil Bonnet runs in seventh. There are the two leaders, first and second, Earnhardt, Gant. 
see how quick Harry Gant has closed up on the rear deck lid and looks to the inside as they come across the stripe. Is he going for the lead? Down into turn one. He's on the inside. He's got him. Gant's your new leader. Harry Gant wants to lead this race. And Gant and Earnhardt come very close. Gant, a little bit out of the racing groove we saw from inside of Benny Parsons' car earlier. You get up into the, the, what, the uh, dry stuff up there, and it's very slippery. But you can see that Earnhardt was all crossed up as he came out of turn four. Gant capitalized on it, but he couldn't cash it in until he got all the way down into turn one. Harry Gant, the defending champion of the Southern 500, after 156 laps, reminding you one more time, 183 laps represents the halfway point. The question becomes, if Bill Elliott can, will he go after the lead as we approach the halfway point? Lake Speed, by the way, the third car in line there, the white car with the black and yellow trim is not on the lead lap. There's car number 12, Neil Bonnet. The report was that he was slowing, being called into the pits. Looks as if they've got some trouble on the left side rubber. This is fairly early for them to have to make an exchange after those normal pit stops. Bonnet is going to go a lap down. The leaders are coming past the start-finish line this time. They flash by. Bonnet accelerates, but the leaders are already in the turn number one. So Neil Bonnet becomes yet another victim of the lead lap. Rich, Tim Richmond comes in. He was given the black flag, we are told. Being stopped, they're going to give him... Oh, it was a stop and go. It was just to, you know, to dispense that ruling, the consultation flag. He stopped, he went out, and they put the stop sign up once again. Tim Richmond showing a little bit of frustration with what's going on here. Tim Richmond a little bit concerned over uh, difference of opinion between his crew and NASCAR. And what we talked about, Larry, is you just can't allow yourself to get rattled here. Richmond, now the report is NASCAR is going to give him the consultation flag once again because he didn't adhere to the rules. There's Barry Dotson conferring with one of the NASCAR officials on pit road, arguing his case, but NASCAR calls the shots. They'll bring him back in, and he'll have to go through the stop and go the way they determine it, not the way he determines it. Well, Jack, I think there were a couple of infractions on that. It was not a stop-and-go situation. He did not come to a stop in the pit area. Then he got to the end of pit row. He was given the stop sign and also uh, avoided making that stop there. So Tim Richmond is two, maybe three, perhaps as many as four laps down, and his chances for the Southern 500 this year are over. He's been given the black flag twice. Let's see if he pulls into the pits this time, because you're allowed actually four laps to acknowledge the black flag, and he stays out once again. There is the crossed flag with the black. Now, what that signifies is they are going to next lap drop his scorecard from scoring. They'll just consider him not in the race, a persona non grata. That's the only way they feel they can bring a car in when they refuse to acknowledge the black flag. Well, Tim Richmond is a fire, fiery type of guy. He's very competitive, and he tries to win every contest, be it a game of cards during a rain delay or if it's a short track in a modified or on a dirt track. He tries to win. That's the kind of guy he is. And he's had a very good season. Richmond uh, looks like he's going to stay out one more lap. The cross black flag being shown to Tim, and the race is over. Literally. Let's go to Jerry Punch, who's with the car owner, Raymond Beadle, in the pits. Maybe we get a clarification. Jerry? Raymond, can you clarify what's happening with your car, with Tim Richmond? What's going on? Well, the scores got all messed up when they had the initial caution. We come in behind Harry Gann, uh, the 33 car. We went back out. They, for some reason, they showed us a lap down, and Harry's the leader when we beat Harry back out of the pits. In the meantime, to them and they got fouled up again so Tim went back around with the when the caution car came out they came back in and they penalized him a lap they couldn't just stop for a minute dad waited in like the way he stopped so he had to come back in stop again now he's got to take off again well Tim Richmond just stopped here in the 50 C moving back down pit road his second stop and go penalty he didn't stop completely the first time this time he didn't stop so hopefully that'll be all Jack, it's a little scary to be blunt with you here at this racetrack to see a guy go out with nerves and tempers frazzled like that. This racetrack, even when you're cruising around at 130 miles an hour, can be very, very treacherous. But Larry, rules are rules. Our rules are rules. And when NASCAR says to come in, you should come in. That was my point about maintaining your composure, even if you think you're right. Remember Darrell Walter? He stated his case. He complained at Bristol, Tennessee, but then he went on. He didn't let it bother him any further. He raced the rest of the time. That's not been the case with Tim Richmond, and look how much it's cost him. Meanwhile, back up front, Harry Gant, the man who is ranked 11th in all-time winning for NASCAR. He's won over $2.3 million, is en route to maybe another big payday here today at Darlington. 
He has started 208 times in Grand National competition. He has won seven times, but as we told you, that's good for more than $2 million. In 1985, he has won $465,000. That's ranked third on the money winnings list for this season. He does have a win uh, coming at Martinsville on the short track. What a marked contrast between Martinsville and this place. But you know, ever since Harry Gant came up to the Winston Cup Grand National Brigade after a long tour of duty on the late model sportsman circuit, he has taken to the Darlington International Raceway kind of like a duck to a big, broad pond in North Carolina. He's just loved it. He works that car real hard through the corner. There you can see the tire smoke coming off the car. Again, taking a cut and maybe being just a little tighter than he'd like to be. But he holds on and just works this track that they call too tough to tame to his advantage. Well, that seems appropriate, being a duck to water, because this place was built around a middle pond. Harry Gant continues to lead. The man who is the defending champion of this race, and Bobby Allison is showing some telltale signs which might bring this race to a final chapter for him. Bobby Allison, the man who switched rides in mid-season here, it's something he has done before. He experimented with the Ford. He's been in the Buick a couple of times this season since he's gone to his own team. And now some unburned fuel you can see burning out of the exhaust pipes coming out of the headers as Bobby Allison creeps to his position on the back stretch. The man who has won so many Grand National races, a former Grand National champion, signaling to his crew that his day is probably over. 167 laps are now complete, approaching, fast approaching the halfway point in this race. And Dale Earnhardt and Harry Gant right now are put the two, Bill Elliott. Back at Darlington, just to update you, the guy running in the lead pack right now, up front, the number 12 car, the red machine of Neil Bonnet, is on the lead lap, but is not the leader of this race. He is right now in jeopardy going one lap down to the man who is leading this race, Harry Gant, running in second in that red car, the second red car, is Bill Elliott. And while we were away, we went under green, and Terry Labonte had a flat tire, was forced to come into the pits, and Terry went a lap down. And you take a look at Harry Gant, he's measured up Neil Bonnet as they go into three, he's going to try, and there, there's a good example, Larry, of, even though a driver may have a shot on the guy, Harry Gant had a good shot at Neil Bonnet, he saw that corner coming up and backed out of the because you cannot pass going into the corner, especially three. Bonner right now is driving for all he is worth because he knows exactly the situation he is in, that he may go one lap down to the leader again. He would like to hold Harry back as long as he can. He's hoping for a yellow flag. You see Harry right on his bumper, bumping Neil, staying with him, coming out of turn number two, letting Neil go. I want to get by. Well, Gant's trying to get a run, a solid run, down into three. There's exactly what he did. Now, look, look, Bonnet's going to go back on the inside, trying to get it back. They're working out of turn four, and Bonnet's got it. And look, whoa, almost into the wall comes Harry Gant. He bangs into Bonnet. Look at Earnhardt going to the inside. Three abreast going into the number one corner. Earnhardt on the inside, going for the lead. And Harry Gant is pushed back to second. Now he'll try the inside of Dale, coming out of turn number two. Earnhardt in that very dangerous high groove. He gets around, and Harry Gant is still squirming a bit. A little retribution cost Harry Gant the lead momentarily. Well, I don't know, but he's getting it back from Earnhardt, going into three. Moves Earnhardt up just a tad, gets back in line, and he's back in front. Now, who says that Dale Earnhardt, by the way, with the red wheels, he's probably been for somebody, is the only guy who can play contact sports and still drive a NASCAR car? Well, good point. Now, look at Bill Elliott. He's in third position, but he's being hounded by the nemesis and another Ford Thunderbird, Kale Yarbrough. Look at the, look at the nine there. We're working the car here, and we're going down the back stretch top of the car as we work into the corner. You'll see the number. The number looks as if, indeed, it's backwards. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, isn't that interesting? That's no, you know, what it, you know what it stands for? Look at it again. It looks like E for Elliot. <laughs> well put. You know, David Pearson is the last guy to win three of the four Triple Crown races. And he did it on a weekend of a hurricane back in 1976. You know what the hurricane's name was? Well, it was 79. Hurricane David and Hurricane Elaine, which begins with an E, of course, is sweeping through or approaching the country this weekend. Is that a good omen for Bill Elliott? Well, let's take a look and see if Elliott can get around Neil Bonham here. I just love that backwards nine. I just stay the back. And look at Kale Yarbrough. Yarbrough's beginning to show a little more muscle, Larry, since that last pit stop. He looks like he's getting, as you say, a little racy here. Now they're working around Neil Bonnet, who does not want to give up easily, although Bonnet seems to 
make a gentlemanly gesture to Bill Elliott as Elliott goes around on the outside. Elliott just isn't showing the high speed that we saw in the first 50 laps of the race. Let's take a look at a couple laps ago when Gant and Bonnet were going in. Gant was out of shape, crowded down into Neil Bonnet. Look who capitalizes way down almost on the apron. Earnhardt comes across the stripe side by side. Looks like he's trying to come back in. He cuts across the grain and gets almost by Harry Gant for the lead. Well, as this is going on, Daryl Waltrip is coming into the pit area. Junior Johnson himself out with the signboard. Watch for Junior when Daryl comes to a stop. Dale, Erna, Dale Waltrip in the pits of the Budweiser Chevrolet. They've changed right side tires. Has to be an unscheduled stop. Looks to be possibly a right side tire going down. The car getting a little bit loose. He goes to the left down to the leader. He is now moving away. 13.1, 10 seconds. Good pit stop. Nick Bergen standing by for the pit road. And I'm with Travis Carter. Travis, you look like you're running extremely well, but is there more muscle in that number 33 car? Well, it's... He's probably running as well as he can possibly run. I know Bill is, is, is being cautious. I know Bill has a little left. Uh, luck's certainly going to have to be on our side. We, You know, the car's been off and on. Sometimes we change the right side to run good. Change the left side tires and that's one as well. So we've got to make some adjustments to compensate such a... When we change either side of the car, we're taking the well. I think we're going to close that Well, Travis Carter has his best car here. This is the automobile that won last year's Southern 500. We have just completed lap 183. If they want to, they can make this race now official at any point. The weather has been cooperating beautifully. The sun has been ducking in and out of the clouds. Boy, you see Harry again right there, bringing lots to lots, coming around the corner here at Darlington. The weather, as we mentioned, has been really helping us out here, and it's beginning to look like this will be a race that will go 500 miles. continue to burn that right rear tire. And as you said, Larry, they were going as lock to lock, trying to cut that car around the corner. The interesting point here is that even though Earnhardt, that guy, and Gann, who runs in front of him, I wonder who the two wheels those are, by the way. Anyway, as we watch those two guys, everybody is still looking over their shoulder at Bill Elliott, who looks like he's running on rails compared to the first two. Well, you can watch the shot as Earnhardt goes by and Gant. Both of them smoke the tires, but when you take a good, hard look in that same area at Bill Elliott, you can't say that. That thing just runs just like it has at Daytona, Talladega, and everywhere that he's won, it's just been like on a rail. Bill Elliott, the man who has now won, despite the backwards nine on the roof, on every super speedway on the trail. He won here in the spring. He faces the possibility of becoming only the second man in history to execute a sweep, fast qualifying time, and two race wins in one season. Let's illustrate what we we're talking about. Now watch, see, as he goes through, Elliott has no problem, no tire smoke. The car is handling, takes a little bit of a drift up to the wall, but he can cut the car in fine fashion. And that's a good indication of just how well that car is working. But the question mark is, how much more does he have left? Well, obviously, Travis Carter, the man who works on that machine, feels as though there is more left. You can see Harry Kent really working hard. He's a great shot as he comes around turn number four. You can see the right hand way down on the left-hand side of the steering wheel as Harry Gant is having to do a lumberjack job of taking that car around one lap here in Darlington. Imagine when you're coming up on an interstate, one of those old-fashioned clover leaves where you get up high there and you're trying to go through it at about 75 or 80 miles an hour. It throws you around in the seat. Well, that's the issue here. Looks like we've got a caution that's been dispensed for car 51. Slick Johnson having his hands full today in this Southern 500. And the caution is out. Yeah, Slick Johnson, who entered here in the Johnson Racing Board, it's a car that he brought some money to to help finance this operation and this effort for this week here at Darlington. Johnson, who is a, a sometime driver on the Grand National Circuit, you can see that he has made contact in that cleaner hands car on the right-hand side. Once again, the typical Darlington strike. Well, we are halfway through this race, and we've had a number of guys who have dominated this. Bill Ed, of course, one of them. At 184 laps, the time of the race was just a little more than two hours. Average speed was a little less than 120. There have been nine different leaders. They have exchanged the lead 13 times, six caution flags for a total of 37 laps up to that point, the halfway point in the race. Out of the race at this point, David Pearson, the Silver Fox, the man who qualified in the front row, Bill Parsons and Rusty Wallace, and a spectacular crash coming out of turn number four, and Tommy Houston, Greg Sachs, H.B. Bailey, Bobby Allison, and most recently, Trevor Boyd. 
there you see some of the 80, 70 or 80,000 strong who have traveled here to the Darlington International Raceway, the top 10 after 184 laps. Harry Gant, Dale Earnhardt, Bill Elliott, Cale Yarborough, and Jeff Bodine. Sixth through tenth, Benny Parsons, Ricky Rudd, Benny Parsons, Ron Bouchard, and Neil Bonnet. So Bill Elliott still has very much an uphill battle to turn in if he wants to win the Winston Million. Darrell Waltrip today driving the familiar Junior Johnson red and white number 11 is at the head of the pack, the head of the class, but he is the length of the racetrack behind. He is on the lead lap, but at the very end of it, Dale Earnhardt right now is the leader, but Dale Earnhardt has been driving on some very unfamiliar wheels and tires, and D Dick Bergman is down there now. Yeah, he sure has, Larry. What they're doing is they're going up and down pit road and borrowing tires and wheels from anybody they can borrow them from. What they're trying to find is exactly the right combination, the right stagger, the right tire size to let the car go as fast as possible. And that's why you're seeing different wheels on the car. Importantly, this pit crew has got an incredible virus going through it. They're, they are all not feeling well, every one of them. In fact, the only guy on the Wrangler team that is healthy right now is Dale Earnhardt. One of the crew members is gone completely, and the rest of them just really wish they could lie down instead of having to service this car. So they're working hard, and I'm going to leave before I get sick, too. Do you see on the back of Dale Earnhardt's car, it says 1-800-FARM-AID? We were talking about it before. You know, that's the thing that Willie Nelson is so heavily involved in, trying to raise funds for the farmers. Well, Wrangler Jeans and Willie Nelson have gotten together, and there you got a good shot at it. They're getting together to uh, work a special promotion for that. And as we alluded to early in the race, we understand that Willie Nelson may become one of these so-called, quote-unquote, celebrity owners of a race, and it would be Dale Earnhardt. One tough customer with Willie Nelson. Now, that's a pair that beats a full house. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question about that. He would join T.G. Shepard, of course, who owns that red car, that number four car involved in the ownership of that. Joe Ruckman's ride for the 1985 season. Looking for green flag. Ten cars. Ten cars still on the lead lap. Neil Bonnet may have been caught unaware. He drops down to the apron. He was one lap down, and now he works from a tremendous deficit on the restart of this race. I believe they wanted to call him into the pits, and he missed the slot, and he has to go all the way back around, and this will be costly for Bonnet. You can see him working through the junk there, slipping and sliding, but meanwhile, up front, it continues to be Dale Earnhardt just gobbling up real estate. Remember, Tim Richmond is a number of laps down. Waltrip has lost the lap in just this last half a lap to Dale Earnhardt. Nine cars are on the lead lap. Here they are, those nine cars. Earnhardt, Elliott, Gant, Cale Yarbrough, Sly, Foxy, Old Cale, Jeff Bodine, rather quiet today, but don't count him out. Benny Parsons, Buddy Baker, Ricky Rudd, and Ron Bouchard, despite all that damage in the front end, is still on the lead lap. And Dick Bergen is down in the pit area where Neil Bonnet is coasting to a stop. And here he is, and they're going to make a change of left side tires on the Bonnet car. Incidentally, there is a new left side tire here, and it looked like the left front is not that old here, and it should have. They're good years using a new left side tire here for the very first time. Lots and lots of testing went into it, so there's no apparent tire problem. Bonnet with an apparent left front problem. Until a couple of laps ago, he was only one lap down, and now he may be as many as three. Neil Bonnet really having problems at the restart of this race. Look at the battle for second heating up, though. Bill Elliott and Harry Gant, they've run for the lead in the past. Well, now they're sequestered back in second, and they're trying to hold off each other's advances. Elliott looks to the inside of his points rival, Darrell Walter, who's going to lap down, goes into turn one. And he's also trying to cover that spot that Gant is trying to appropriate from him as they come out of turn turn two and head down the back stretch. My guess is, Jack, that Bill Elliott is ready to move to the lead, and I don't know that he can. I think he's finding it tougher sledding than he anticipated. Well, Larry, I would still have to say that Bill Elliott is running the exact precise kind of race that will keep you in the hunt for the $1 million that he's gunning for. Likewise, for Cale Yarbrough. You know, many of us have said, if Yarbrough is around with 50 laps to go, he most likely will be the guy in the shootout for the victory. He's run well today. Also, the 88 car of Buddy Baker. What a terrific run for him. There's a lot of guys that are playing heads-up racing here at Darlington today and staying on that lead lap. Buddy Baker has not won for two seasons. His last win was at Daytona in 1983. 
a guy who was one here and earlier in his career was the acknowledged king of the super speedways. Remember that what Dick Bergeron alluded to about the Earnhardt car, while it's in the lead, he is out looking for tires. He's out shopping, trying to find the right stagger. You haven't seen anybody, Ernie Elliott and his team, going up and down pit road looking at tires. They've made very few adjustments. They're happy with the position and also with the running of that race car. They think it's handling fine. Very few people have been able to put together back-to-back -back wins on the Grand National Trail in 1985. Should Earnhardt do it today, as a matter of fact, he is the only one who has the opportunity today to put together back-to-back -to -back wins. Tim Richmond now running high, wide, and handsome up front, but after the differences of opinion that he had with the NASCAR officials and scoring earlier in the race, he really wiped out any chance he had for doing well here today. But it seems to have settled down, and he's running very competitively again, Jack. And the contest for that second position continues to be embroiled between two cars. Earnhardt working his way through lap traffic, and it's kind of like threading a needle around here at Darlington. You go to the high side and the inside. Tim Richmond continues to show real loose, but he's really not a factor in the front runners other than being part of that complete contingent, not on the scoreboard, as we've said. But as you look at car number nine, Bill Elliott, he's got right directly behind him his nemesis, the guy that's led a lot of laps today, and that's the 33 of Harry Gant. Earnhardt is pulling away, but remember, as we said, he's got some tire problems. They're still searching for that stagger. Tim Richmond is exactly four laps in arrears as you watch him follow around running in his lead pack, zipping by you at better than 150 miles an hour. They move up to about 170 just before they touch the brakes and go into the 21-degree bank corner. Bill Elliott in the number nine car running fast, as is Benny Parsons. See him going to work on the high side of Ken Reagan, following around Joe Ruffin. How'd you like to drive with that sort of a windshield all afternoon? But that's just normal Bill Affair here. He dispatches Ruttman in fine fashion. See, it's not too bad out the back, but all the debris and the oil and the grease that comes off of other cars as part of 500 miles, it just occludes your vision so bad that you really end up squinting when you get out of one of these cars and trying to see what's going on. Benny has had a tenacious race. He is in sixth position on the lead lap. He's about Oh, it's straight away behind the front-running cars, and he's still very much in it. Sometimes Grand National Stock Car Racing, particularly at a track like this, is simply a matter of staying on the lead lap till the last 50 laps. Take a look. There's Benny Parsons taking you around Darlington International Raceway. Want to try it, Larry? I don't think I'm quite ready for that. I found out last year that it wasn't even ready for Odyssey Racing and Go-Kart Racing. Here is Benny Parsons. He stood up here and talked with him yesterday, and now he's out doing battle at 150-plus miles an hour. 203 laps have been officially completed. Everything is cruising along smoothly. Eight cars remain on the lead lap, and this could be a humdinger right down to the final laps. Bill Elliott still has very much of a chance for $1 million. Still riding with Benny Parsons, turning hard left at 150 miles an hour plus. Look at the jostling that you take when you work the corners. Then you take a look at the tachometer there. As he works down through the corners, you'll get a good chance to hopefully see it as it drops off. Well, you're going to take a look at the racetrack here instead. But he works himself to death there. And remember, you know, you're doing that for over 700 times here. You've got to keep twisting and turning and working. Benny Parsons is going to lose some poundage today. Well, the cars will crank off at about 76, 7,700 RPMs here on a racetrack like at Darlington, and Benny Parsons has given his all that he has worth. Here are the winnings through 19 events of 1985. You can see Elliott on the brink of the first million dollars, not even the R.J. Reynolds million we've been talking about. Walt took over $700,000, and that drops off significantly to Gant at 460, Labonte at almost $436,000, and Jeff Bodine, despite not winning yet this year, is ranked fifth with 336 plus thousand dollars. You know, Larry, one of the things we learned this week is with that Bill Elliott team, they have a unique profit sharing plan with a lot of their crew members. What they did is they pay a base salary, then a percentage of earnings. That's a lot more of what you see on the car circuit or even as far as in Formula One, but it's the first time we've heard of it on the Grand National Trail. Think about that, knowing each and every one of those guys is going to share in that $1 million payday for the championship and then another million dollars today. They could, some of those guys could double their salary. You know, there might be a lesson there. These guys are known for the long hours that they keep, and 
because everybody has a stake in it, maybe it's easier to get up at 4.30 in the morning and uh, go back home at midnight. Well, you know, we've seen a lot in, in major businesses where the employees have taken over the business and run it. Maybe this is the first chapter in which to cover an national race. Well, without a doubt, the Elliots, as we continue to watch the leader, Bill and uh, Dale Earnhardt, the Elliots have done a lot to perhaps change the face of Grand National Racing in the future. So much of their success they've earned on their own and this is kind of a change there were a lot of secrets that were passed down from team to team as crew chiefs changed and different makes of cars went to different teams and there was a lot of stuff that was learned by other drivers who current drivers are actually uh, benefiting from right now but not so the case with the Elliott's. Dale Earnhardt has been one of the dominant figures of this race he's been at this racetrack many times and we had an opportunity to visit with him earlier this week so much this weekend, but Bill Elliott is on the verge of winning a million dollar bonus. Dale Earnhardt doesn't have a shot at that, but he's got to race Bill Elliott. Do you race him any different knowing that he's got a chance at a million dollars? Race him to win. You know, if I can beat him, I'm going to try to beat him, and if I can't beat him, I hope he wins it. The king of muscle of Grand National Stock Car Racing, Dale Earnhardt. You know, Larry, you talked about how much the Elliots have rewritten the record books and also the way you do battle in a Grand National division. Well, Dale Earnhardt has done precisely the same thing. He's one of these young Turks that came up and was tapped after running so well in late model sportsman competition, captured the Rookie of the Year, and then did something that was unheard of the following year, come back and tie down the Winston Cup Grand National Championship. Then he switched over, you know, was mired in all that controversy when the Stacy team was on and Osterlin got out. But you know what? Ever since he's hooked up with Richard Childress, he's begun to show a lot more championship poise and ability at beginning to come to the top for Dale Earnhardt. He's a true superstar in his own right. We're going to see a lot of him in years to come. He also represents the new breed of the 1970s and 80s drivers. They have a heritage. Their father, their brother, an uncle was involved in racing, and Dale's father, Ralph, was one of the very best in stock car racing. He made his name on the dirt tracks, but had there been paved tracks and super speedways around in the variety and the plentiness that we have them now, Ralph Earnhardt may have been one of the great Grand National drivers in the 50s and 60s. Although I was, didn't have the opportunity ever to watch the late Ralph Earnhardt race, people that have say that when you look at Dale Earnhardt run on a super speedway or a short track like Bristol, Tennessee, there's so much that reminds them of his father, the dirt tracking ability, the, the being able to handle a car in what looks like a controlled slide, even though you're on pavement. It seems to be the Earnhardt signature, whether your name is Ralph or your name is Dale. Well, Earnhardt, just to update you, uh, is really moving away from Elliott. He's four seconds ahead of Elliott, although Elliott is not in second position, but just to kind of keep tabs on that situation as this race is moving further and further into the halfway point, past the halfway point, Earnhardt leads Gant by about 10 laps. Well, he also lets, but we have had a terrific battle for second position between Elliott and Gail Yarbrough. Yarbrough has tried, lost a little bit of ground working some race traffic, and Gant, that's actually the battle for third position because Harry Gant is running in second, and he's really not having any problems right now, but Yarbrough is just climbing all over Bill Elliott, and that's the main race right now on the racetrack, the battle for third spot. Trip is also in the picture there. Remember, Daryl had to make an on-scheduled stop, and he, like his teammate Neil Bonnet, lost a lap in the middle of this contest, which might come back to haunt him later in the event. There is Cale Yarbrough, the man who has won more Southern 500 than any other driver. He used to sneak into this racetrack, crawl underneath the fence as an adolescent, and watch his heroes run in the very early days of the Darlington racetrack. Looks like Yarbrough may be measuring up Bill Elliott, trying to figure out where he can take a run on him. He's showing a little bit of white smoke, Yarbrough that is, so that car isn't handling exactly as he'd like. They're spiling Bill Elliott. You know, a guy that's just so unpretentious, do you realize that with all the money that he's earned, he still lives in the basement of his grandmother's home? And no plans to move out no matter what happens at the end of this year. And speaking about the end of this year, this year has been remarkable. If Bill Elliott and Ernie and Dan parked it right now, they've had just a tremendous season, and they are on the brink of not only one million, but maybe two million total dollars for 1985. Let's take a look at the interval between the leader, Earnhardt. They're second. Dan goes by. Third is Walt. Well, third is Elliott, but Walt took went by. There is third position, and right behind him is fourth position, Cale Yarbrough. There you see Earnhardt again, coming out of turn number four. 
seemingly with ease this time. No traffic to uh, muddle the affair or to steer around. Earnhardt out front. Again, continues the late chase down as they move into turn number one of this historic old race plan. You know, Larry, it looks to me like uh, Gant is beginning to close on Earnhardt, and both of them collectively are pulling away from third, fourth, and fifth positions. Dale Earnhardt, one tough customer, a winner a week ago at Bristol when he muscled to the inside of Tim Richmond and was able to get the lead at the very final stages of the race on that very exciting half-mile racetrack in Bristol. So with 219 laps of the scheduled 360 complete, we look at Dale Earnhardt, the leader. Harry Gant runs in second, and third is Bill Elliott. When Dale Earnhardt took the green flag in today's race, it propelled him over $3 million in career winnings on the NASCAR Grand National Trail. 207 times he has taken the green flag. He has won 14 times. By the way, that's about 7% of the races that he has entered. And he is ranked seventh in money's won in 1985, over $330,000, plus whatever he does today. And today, he might really enter that total. Boy, he's going to have to contend with Harry Gant very shortly, though, Larry. We are right. Gant is closing in on Earnhardt, little by little. But we'll take a look at Earnhardt here and just see if we can get... Oh, there he goes by Poncho Carter. You know, got to give some kudos to Poncho. He's doing a terrific job as a rookie as well. He stays really out of the way, lets the leader go on by, and then gets back to his own version of racing. Got to be a lot different than going 200 miles an hour in Indianapolis much different I'm sure a lot more weight involved over twice the weight involved in a stock car than the IndyCar of course uh, Poncho was severely injured in an IndyCar practice session in Phoenix a number of years ago but he has really stuck with the career against some very tall odds Poncho Carter has stayed with it he's learned to drive on road courses he's learned to shift actually using his body almost as much as his feet and just try that on a pleasure car if you think that's not tough let me pose a question to you Larry and to our viewers as well as we see a shift in championship auto racing with the advent of road races which of course as you know they do not allow poncho to compete on do you think maybe i repeat maybe we'll see poncho move over like like tim richmond did to winston cup grand national competition and maybe give way to the road racers of the world and let them have at it in cart poncho has been asked that very question a number of times this week as we see bill elliott go around the answer right now is no. You see, he won the 1985 Indianapolis 500 full, of course. But right now, Poncho's plan is to continue emphasizing the open wheelers. He loves those Indianapolis cars. But he's always looking toward other types of racing activity, as he has said a number of times this week. And I think we can expect to see him a few more times, particularly in 86 at the Grand National Trail, but also continues to run the Indianapolis cars. us an opportunity here to watch a guy Dale Earnhardt going around the Darlington racetrack and when you think of tough racetracks there's probably no better man to watch than this one. He can wrestle a race car a 3700 pound race car around a speedway better than anybody. Now let's check his time on this lap. The pole speed was 31.3 31.4 seconds but you figure to run Oh, maybe two seconds slower than that when you're in competition. Now, yesterday, Benny Parsons called one jack right on the spot. He said, now oh, they're probably going about 33 seconds a lap right now. And guess what? The time was 33.0. You're not expecting <laughs> me to do that, are you? Dale Earnhardt tearing down the backstretch, looking toward number three. No traffic in front of him, so this will be a clean lap. This is the kind that the road racers like to have when they're out in the time practice sessions, the morning, the day before the race. You're out there qualifying. You like to have a clean racetrack so you can see how good you can do. I think he'll do about a 32.2. Uh, that's a pretty good guess. 32.2. Earnhardt actually going 152.7 miles an hour. That's a little quicker, to tell you the truth, than I expected him to be going at this juncture of the race. Well, he's still working the car very well. And, he, you know, one thing about Dale Earnhardt, he's very reminiscent of Cale Yarbrough and some of the old school drivers. He will give you about two-tenths of a second by himself just by working within the race car. And speaking of Cale Yarbrough, we've got his chief mechanic on the back pits and let's go to the pits for that report. Waddell, your car is running very strong. How do you stack up against the other front runners? Well, you know, the three car looks like he has everyone pretty much covered. But, you know, it's going to depend on the tires, I guess, who ends up with the good tires through the rest of the race. And if the rest, you know, we've done it without caution. But Tail's not complaining about the car. But I wish I could figure out some way getting him just a little bit more than what he has. Have you got your good set of tires, the last set of tires set aside yet, or are you still looking? Well, 
Well, we're still searching a little bit right now. It's still a ways to go before we have to make a decision on it, but we're thinking about it. Wondell Wilson, Kelly Yarbrough's crew chief, before the race, he said he was going to gear to win, and they're running just like that. Larry, when you talk about a good set of tires, each and every crew chief is concerned, and in some cases, they employ a full-time team member just to look for them. What they're looking for is the proper tire stagger, the outside dimension of those tires, the circumference, to make sure that it complements the chassis setup that they've got. You deal with stagger, maybe the difference between the inside and the outside tire by as much as maybe an inch, but by as little as maybe an eighth of an inch. And you have to make that compatible with the spring setup that you've got on the race car. So when you hear them saying we're looking for the right set, they're looking for the best set that'll be compatible with the handling setup they've gone into the race with. And of course, track conditions can certainly determine a part of that. And every crew starts out with what they think might be the best setup. But track conditions and atmospheric conditions can change during the running of the race. And it might change your mind as to what is my best set. Jerry Punch is still standing by in the pit area. He's got some more thoughts on tires. We talked about stagger early in the race. Dale Earnhardt's crew down here said that the track has changed so much since the beginning of the race. It's gotten so slick, they're looking for tires. You heard Dick Bergen say earlier, they were searching everywhere for tires. They need to close the stagger up on the car. That means the left and right rear tires have to be almost the same size, so the car will be able to take a good hold onto the racetrack. They're searching for tires. Stagger is so important here at Darlington. And when it gets slick, that's what you're looking for, a perfect balance in the car, so no matter where you put it on the racetrack, of course, you only have two lanes to choose from here, the car fits well. Dale Earnhardt, the man who has not done well here the last two times that they have raced at Darlington, would like to recoup for some of those losses recently. Now on the screen, Buddy Arrington, a man who last week at Bristol started career race number 500. And Buddy Arrington has done yeoman duty in Winston Cup Grand National Racing. And, you know, he's kind of one of the unheralded independents. But we think that we have a better word for them. They should be called privateers, the guys that don't have the financing of sponsors, but they go in week in and week out. And he makes a living out of it, driving a race car 30 times a year. And his son, Joey, is listed as the crew chief. He started the race today in 33rd position. He's shown some flashes of speed this year, qualified well up to the top 10 on the super fast Talladega racetrack. And he told me earlier this year, he's got a lot of confidence for 1986. He thinks he's learning some things with the Ford and he's actually looking forward already to next season. Well, Arrington has got a lot of years under his belt. You know, he was injured several years ago. Well, now it's almost a decade ago, quite seriously at Talladega, Alabama, but he bounced back and he still calls Martinsville, Virginia his home. And, you know, he's just the same old laid back Buddy Arrington that first came on the Grand National Tour. He lives the dream of many American males to make a living out of being a race car driver. Lake Speed, Ken Reagan on the screen momentarily. There is the leader, Dale Earnhardt, moving in on Joe Rutman. Rutman is two laps down uh, to the leader, Dale Earnhardt. Rutman, who has had some misfortune in stock car racing the last couple of months, but today, seem to be cruising along pretty well for him. Dale Earnhardt continues to lead this race, followed by Harry Gant, Bill Elliott, Cale Yarborough, and Benny Parsons. We still have eight cars in the lead lap. Bodine, Baker, Bouchard, Rudd, and Walter. One of the rookies in today's race, Mike Waltrip in the Bayer Racing, Quinsenberry Racing, Jim Testa Chevrolet car. And he's a rookie here, as you can tell by the yellow bunting on the back bumper. But He's doing all he can to get rid of that status, Jack. It looks like it. Some of the duct tape that has been applied there to signify that he's a rookie has come unglued from the bumper, and it's trailing in the wind. So he's a rookie to the ultimate this afternoon. When guys come up on him, they see that waving and say, hey, <laughs> look at I'm new here. It's got to be a thrill for Mike. We have seen him many times in Darlington Dash Race, and here's a guy like Earnhardt who really likes to stand on the butt. And I would imagine he's running a controlled race here at Darlington today because he likes to get up front if it's at all possible. And it's very difficult, I would imagine, for Mike Waltrip to run against the grain of his own thoughts and kind of run a controlled race and just try and finish and get some miles. Likewise, it's got to be difficult for the leaders, Larry, because they're right now forced to run that sort of controlled race themselves. Dale Earnhardt in your picture there, leading over Harry Gant, running in third. There's Gant as he goes by. We'll get a good look at the separation there. Gant pulls down into one. There is Earnhardt, your leader. He's got to control his emotions because there's still over 100 laps to go. And Gant, he just can't envision trying to close quickly. He's got to do it methodically, slowly, because there's plenty of laps left to make a run for the front. Okay, Elliott is third. Kale Yarbrough is fourth. 
Benny Parsons is fifth. Bodine is sixth. Buddy Baker still holds fast in seventh position on the lead lap. Ron Bouchard eighth. Ricky Rudd is ninth. Now one lap down is Darrell Waltrip running on the track, by the way. Right behind Bill Elliott. Terry Labonte is 11th. One lap down. Bobby Hillen is in 12th position in that bright yellow number eight. One lap down. And Joe Rutman is 13th, also one lap down. Well, Darrell Waltrip tried to get himself a couple of spots back, not necessarily in the running order, but chronologically as he went around Bill Elliott there. You know, Waltrip is still in the chase here. He's still in the hunt. If he can work his way back up and take advantage of some good caution driving, you know, maneuvering during the caution periods, he can maybe still gain that lap back. We saw it with David Pearson one year when he went a lap down early in this race and came back and almost won it. Of course, they crashed over there in turns one and two, and Terry Bobani went home to victor. But it was some great racing at the end here at Darlington. That guy in that red number nine went down two laps in a race earlier this year, and he came back to win. And right now, Dick Bergen is with his brother, who's very much involved in the construction design and operation of this race team. Ernie, what are you guys going to turn up the wick on the car? We're loose right now. We can't turn it up. You know, we're running as hard as we can run. Can you get the set of tires that'll square it away for you? Well, you know, all that's a gamble, so, you know, you don't really know. Well, Bill Elliott apparently having tire problems, as are several other teams, just trying to find the right set. There's nothing wrong with the tires. It's just getting them exactly matched. Still a ways to go. 245 laps are now down. That's uh, approaching the 350-mile point of this race. 500 miles, 367 laps makes up the total of the Southern 500. Bill Elliott has really swept this season, the 1985 season of Grand National Racing. He has won nine times. You can see the money. He has won $903,000 in race winnings. $727,000 is another figure that pops up. Nine speed records on three different tracks. He's had one. He is one win shy of the single season record. That's 10 set by David Pearson. Grand National wins in 1985 have been selfishly clutched by just a handful of drivers. Matter of fact, only eight. And only three have won more than once. And one of the three is Dale Earnhardt. He looks like he has a real clean shot at going after win number four here at Darlington in the famed Southern 500 today. Bill Elliott, of course, leads that hit parade with nine wins. And Neil Bonnet is the only other driver who has won more than once. Larry, by our calculations, we should start to have some normal pit stops very shortly. But there's Buddy Baker, and a call has got to go down for his run. With, a, with an Oldsmobile that many people said Oldsmobile was not going to be the hot setup this year. He's been trying it with Danny Schiff, his co-car owner, and Robert Harrington, who's really a good chief mechanic in his own right. And they've been doing this all year. Big, strapping Buddy Baker has always dreamed about the Southern 500. He said, I get psyched up more about this race than all of the other races put together. This is the one I want to win. This is the one I want to go after. You know, his dad, Buck, won it three times. Buddy Baker ranked seventh on the all-time list for most money won. He's already tested the 1986 street version of the Oldsmobile, and his comment after it said, hey, I think they finally come up with something to rival the Fords. Dick Bergman can update us on a piece of drama that is beginning to develop down in the pits. Indeed it is, Larry. Pancho Carter's car is behind pit wall, and Pancho's lying down behind me in his hauler. The problem apparently is that he's burned his foot on the floorboards of the car. Now, this is something very common to Grand National Racing, but again, Pancho Carter hasn't been in a Grand National car since 1970. Right now, the treatment is they're putting ice on it. Standard procedure for a burn. Another treatment that's taking place on pit road is a quick stop by Darrell Waltrip. We alluded to the fact that we could be seeing pit stops. Normal routine coming up very shortly. Waltrip, one of the first, he's in and out. There's Earnhardt and Gant. Are we going to see the battle right down here to the, to the pits to see who gets out first? Yarbrough is pitted, Waltrip, Bodine, and here comes Bill Elliott. has just come off of turn number four, coming to a stop underneath the green flag. Let's see what they do. Now, remember, they were not very happy with the setup. Let's see what changes they make. They're going to the right side. Are they making any chassis adjustments? Ernie Elliott leans in. Yes. Looks like maybe two, maybe three turns. There on the left side, he's off and away. 15.0, that's not a bad green flag stop. Considering how much work that they did. He goes one lap down, but of course, Gant and Earnhardt will have to pit one more time. Unofficially, this will move Benny Parsons up to third and Buddy Baker up to fourth position in the race. 
Joe Rutman is another one of the drivers coming in. Of course, he's out it for the win right now. Earnhardt and Gant are going to go after it right now for the lead. Gant goes, takes a look to the inside. Earnhardt says, nothing doing, friend. I'm going to stay out in the lead. Now, remember one other issue, Larry. We saw it at the Champion Spark Club 400. Gant seems to have a propensity for going longer between fuel stops than his competitors. You know, they've been working with that fuel flow meter inside the car. Travis Carter alluded to us before that late race caution that he'd go the distance. So Earnhardt's the next soldier to drop off to the wayside to take on fuel and tires. And look who's out front, Harry Gant. Normally, the ability to go 10, 12 miles longer than all your competitors would not be an advantage here in Darlington because there are so many yellow flags, but it might work to hear an advantage. Jerry is down in the pit area. The leader, Dale Earnhardt, in for his stop. They will change left side tires on the Earnhardt car. Jeff Bodine was in. He got left side tires. Well, Bill Elliott got right side rubber. They have one can of fuel in. They're adding the second can. It should be a good stop for Earnhardt as the cars move down and away. Good pit stop for Dale Earnhardt. So Dale Earnhardt becomes the eighth leader to pit under green flag. Harry Gant stays out there. It was something we all kind of anticipated, but weren't really convinced it would be a significant factor in this race. Harry Gant continues to motor around while the USAC champion, the sprint car and midget champion, Pancho Carter, is now out of the car. Pancho, you look awful overtired. Well, I'm not really overtired. It's just that the seat in the Lancaster Tobacco Special was just a little uncomfortable for me. I haven't run a Grand National car before. And I really didn't run enough laps to get the car real comfortable seat seating position. But I started developing a cramp in my heel, and I also had my heel laying on the floorboard, and it was getting real hot and starting to burn. And I finally ended up getting a cramp in my knee and couldn't work the brake pedal anymore. So I knew I was being a menace to everybody else, and I knew it was a smart thing to do was to come in and get somebody that could at least work the brake. And they did. Right now, getting in the car right in front of Poncho Carter is Phil Parsons that crashed earlier in the day. They're shooting him up and strapping him in, and very shortly, he's going to take off in this number one automobile. Here comes the leader, Harry, again in the pits. By the way, Poncho Carter's decision, that's a brave one, i got to tell you. Similar to the decision of Willie T. Ripps, I think, made at Indianapolis this year. Here comes the leader, Harry Gann. He didn't go a tremendously longer distance than everybody else did, but he did go farther, and Jerry Punch is right there. Again, left side tires for Harry Gant, the leader, with Cole Benton, Chevrolet is in for service. Again, gets a cold break to clean the windshield. Left front tires on, left rear tires on, off the jack. A little over 12 seconds, good pit stop for Harry Gant. Should give him an advantage on the racetrack. Jack, the fastest pit stop of all the leaders, 11 seconds. That's almost four seconds faster than Elliott's. Boy, and that really can gobble up some real estate when you equate it back out on the racetrack. Remember, you're touring this place in about 31 to 33 seconds. So lopping off four seconds on a pit stop will really work to your advantage. Well, visually, there is Earnhardt in the middle of the backstretch. Gann is entering turn number three as the leader. Bill Elliott right now is just coming out of turn number two. So that gives you an idea of how much difference there is between those three cars. Cale Yarborough is sandwiched in the middle there. Yarborough is about equal distance in front of Elliott as he is behind the uh, number 33 car, the number uh, three car of uh, Dale Earnhardt. Dick Bergen is working his tail off down in the pit area, and he has another update for us. And another fellow that worked awful hard this week was A.J. Foyt, and right now he's behind the wall. What's happened, A.J.? Well, actually, he's having brake problems all day, and I couldn't get in the corners. And we got down, we kept trying to work, and finally we lost all the brakes, and I was just a hazard. The reason I was having to shut off and let them go on by when traffic come up there, because with no brakes, if somebody would chop down them, I'd have to hit them. Did you enjoy Darlington while the car was working? I really do. I'm looking forward to coming back because it's a racer's racetrack. you got to want to race to race here. And if it's a racer's racetrack, you can bet A.J. Foyle will return to this place. I think that's a measure of the respect that everybody has for this racetrack. And we've got trouble. Clark Dwyer spinning coming off of turn number four. This will really help everybody who has lost ground to Harry Gant during this green flag pit stop. Dwyer getting in trouble near what he did yesterday afternoon in practice, Jack. You know, you've got a question if maybe it's just a mental miscue that makes that happen to a youngster like Clark Dwyer. You know, you're wrestling inside these 3,700-pound race cars. And, uh, you know, it's, it's real tough to keep it all together. Let's take a look. See, well, he's already well into it. He's got the brakes locked up pretty close to where H.B. Bailey crashed but, but a year ago. But he keeps it up against that retaining barrier on the inside. Dents and dings the sheet metal, and that's a tough break for that kid from Colorado Springs, Colorado. You can graphically also see how tall the new wall is protecting the pits from the front stretch here at Darlington. 
It's as tall as the race cars. Back inside of Benny Parsons' machine, the coke car heading for pit road as most of the front runners probably will. Benny has been able to keep pace with the leaders. He may be one lap down. It's you know, this is going to be a big break for all the leaders. Remember, they came in under green and they took on right side or left side tires. Now they're going to be able to come back in and they all should come back in to take on the opposite side tire. That means within the last five, six, seven laps or so, they've been able to get four brand new Goodyears all the way around. That's a luxury they normally don't get with the new NASCAR rulings under caution periods. 100 laps to go. Bill Elliott, Darrell Waltrip among those cars in the pit area. Gant and Benny Parsons, two of the other front runners, have already pitted, are back out on the racetrack. You can see that Elliott has had to squeeze into his pit road. Very congested time down there, particularly during caution flags. So Bill Elliott returns to the fray. He continues to chase Dale Earnhardt and Harry Gant, who have set the pace for the last 150 green flag laps here at the Southern 500. The worm is beginning to turn. We're getting down to the final laps of this year's race. Well, we're still under a caution flag for the Clark Dwyer situation. Uh, the car has been removed from the racetrack. There are only four drivers suddenly on the lead lap. Gant, Earnhardt, Yarborough, and Elliott. That last green flag segment, it stopped just a little bit too late for about five drivers. Yes, Larry, it did. And, it, you know, the thing is, though, this is when it starts to, you know, weed the, the rest of the competition out. When you get down to three or four cars, that's when these guys will really begin to race and race hard. And we are down to the final 100 laps. And by the way, inside of that 100 lap window, normally you cannot go the distance on the load of fuel that you have. So we anticipate that everybody else will have to stop one more time because 100 laps is still 137 miles to go. Just one lap to go before we go back to green. Maybe an opportunity to talk to Cale Yarborough. Cale Yarborough, this is Jack Aroot. Waddell Wilson alluded to the fact that you needed to make some adjustments with tires to go for the win. Do you think you've got it settled down now? Well, it's not like uh, exactly like it's like for it to be, but uh, we're going to give it a shot anyway. Well, good luck to you. We'll watch you on this restart, Cale. Darrell Waltrip continues to duck in and out of the pits underneath this yellow flag. Apparently more serious problems we anticipated. There is Waddell Wilson, Cale Yarborough's crew chief, and another win this year would suit them just fine. They have really struggled. They are used to winning three or four times a year under their abbreviated schedule. They've only been able to milk out one win so far this season. Well, here's a good look at the restart with Harry Gant getting ready to come up through the gearbox, getting a little nice breeze inside the cockpit before they drop the green flag. The green flag in the Southern 500 is back underway again. Benny Parsons, of course, in our camera car, one of those drivers who dropped down a lap just at the end of that last green flag segment. Bodine, Ricky Rudd, and Buddy Baker, among the others, who slipped one lap behind. The first four cars with Benny Parsons, the wild card in the mix, are at the top of the race. They're at the front of the pack. It is Gant, Earnhardt, Yarborough, and Bill Elliott. There is the view that people running second, third, and fourth in the race see of a leader. Harry Gant working his way now down out of turn number four, down the front straightaway, beneath Harold Kinder's start-finish line, and up into turn one. Benny Parsons, let's take a look at what the race for second looks like from a camera angle inside a race car. That's Dale Earnhardt being challenged by Cale Yarbrough. Yarbrough, though, no contest right now for that second position. Earnhardt has it and joined it this time. It's at this point of the race where physical conditioning really becomes a factor. It's like a construction worker who works two days in a row. He's pounding iron. He thinks the day is done, but he has to come back and do it for another day without any rest. A yellow flag is a bit of a help, and in some respects, when you get your rhythm going, most drivers would like to just stay out there and keep pounding away. Not at Darlington, though. I think most drivers look forward to the little respite that a caution afford. Cale Yarbrough showing what looked to be a little poop of smoke. I think it was just speedy dry coming out as he ran through it. But that was a cause for a momentary concern as Dale Earnhardt continues to run in second. Great pictures for Benny Parsons' car in that battle for second position. We are not in the latter stages of this race, but we are in perhaps the final third of it. And now you begin to resurrect the question, where is Bill Elliott? Where is that race car? What is its condition? Has he shown the ability to leave? There you can see him. He's the third car on our screen as we continue to look out the back window of Benny Parsons. He's right there, Larry, and he's really in a pretty darn good position to still go for that million dollars. You wonder, has he shown us everything that he has? We have become so accustomed to seeing him dominate our race from the beginning to the middle stages and to the end. 
I don't know that he has the strength that he normally has on a super speed. Well, I, I don't even, I'm not even afraid to stick my neck out on a limb and say he has not shown what he's capable of yet. That's the classic Bill Elliott signature. Only race near the end when it's important. Only do it when you have to. I'm not exactly certain, but I think I am seeing smoke wisping trailing behind Dale Earnhardt. It looked like more than tires. There goes Dale. Let's watch him as he goes into turn three and four. What do you think, Jack? Looks, we'll have to watch him as he comes out of the corner. We are seeing some wisps there, and it, it's hard to tell from that angle whether it is indeed tire smoke or maybe something coming unglued on Dale Earnhardt's car. But look at Bill Elliott. He's going to go around Benny Parsons now. Elliott continues to run in fourth behind Yarborough, Earnhardt. Harry Gant once again is just reeling away. It's like he's just done a big casting move out onto the pond, going fishing. Harry Gant continues to just ooze away from the rest of the field. He has about a second and a half lap lead over second place. Well, you hate to see it. You always want to see the Grand National Championship go down to the wire. And Darrell Waltrip and Junior Johnson, they're having their problems today after what looked to be a fine run. Another unscheduled pit stop. He's coming in awfully slowly into the pits. And it looks like he may be out of brakes. Is that the possibility? Maybe they were trying to slow him down? Well, brakes are such a critical item here at this racetrack. You've heard Foyt and Carter both allude to that, and Darrell was really struggling to bring that car to a halt that time when he came into the pits. Well, you can see Doug Reichert, the crew chief, actually on his teammate's car, Neil Bonnet, go up to the door window and try and hold him and, and slow him down. But there's a lot of white smoke coming out from the left side. Could be that they burned the brakes on the front. There's something terminally wrong with that car up underneath the suspension. So Darrell Waltrip drought almost on the super speedways, although he won at Charlotte earlier this year, continues. He has won something like only three super speedway races in the last three seasons. Darrell Waltrip racking up most of his wins on the short tracks and super speedways continue to be unkind to him. Looking at Tim Richmond doing battle with Buddy Baker. Now, Baker is being posted in the sixth position. Richmond, as we said, with all those problems with NASCAR, has literally dropped off the board. But it looks like he's gathered up his poise and is back to being Tim Richmond, ace race driver. You know, last week in Bristol, when Darrell Waltrip spun out and Bill Elliott continued to run strongly in the top five, we commented that that might have been, it's still too early to call it, of course, the season, but that might have been the death blow to his hopes for the Winston Cup championship in 1985. If that one hurt, this one is a serious injury, and Jerry Punch is down there in the Darrell Waltrip pit. They're working on the Darrell Waltrip car. Evidently, the left front brake on the car had locked up. It totally almost set the brakes on fire. They came in. There is a fire now in the left front of the car. They let it off the jack. They're trying to get a fireman over here to put the fire out. The Budweiser crew scrambling, screaming, the fire and blades beneath the left front of the car. They have a hose here, and here is Mike Hill at the left front of the car trying to squirt on that caliper and get the fire out. Walter still sits inside the car. Tough break for the Budweiser team as the left front caliper literally is golden. And now again is a blaze under the car. Peter Johnson and the crew standing here. Walter sitting disgustingly on pit road. Looks to be a long afternoon for the number 11. Well, Darrell Walter, who won the World 600 in 1985, the Winston 500 in 1982. Looks like his chances are gone. And here's Benny once again coming to a stop. On schedule pit stop for this former champion, Jack. One of the things you always have to be concerned about during restarts is if a tire might equalize or something go out of balance on the tires. And oftentimes you have to come back in even though you've taken on new wheels and tires. That might be the case for Benny Parsons. He goes around the ailing Daryl Waltrip. He's back out on the racetrack. Now watch how quick or how actually how long he stays down on the infield apron. He doesn't get back up in the groove until he's about midway through the corner. That's a real smart driving uh, move by Benny. He doesn't want to get in front of lap traffic. Shifting through the gears and moving back up to speed. He falls in line behind Jerry Labonte, who also lost laps with an unscheduled pit stop earlier in this race. Again, another day that it's not to be for the defending Winston Cup national champion. But it's beginning to look more and more like the day of this guy. Harry Gant took over the lead about lap number 70 or 80 and has run up near the front ever since. Gant has shown a great deal of strength, but no caution flags during pit stops and after the caution flags. Harry Gant racing toward perhaps his second win in a row in the Southern 500. Back at Darlington, and if this guy, Harry Gann, in the green machine wins, it's not going to stretch out that list of people who have won in 1985 because, as you can see, he leads this.
this race running in fourth is Elliott in fifth is Rudd and sixth is Bodine and Rudd and uh, Harry Gant is a guy who has already won in 1985. And they used to call Gant Mr. Runner Up. He seemed to be a bridesmaid more times than he competed in Winston Cup Grand National Races. But in the last couple of years, they've begun to come together as a race team. And the Skull Bandit, led by Travis Carter and Hal Needham, the car owner, are beginning to slowly establish themselves as one of the top teams in competition, whether it's on a short track, a super speedway, or across a hybrid like you'd like have to call Darlington. In the last decade, we have seen how important starting up front is here at the very rough and tumble Darlington racetrack. Harry is the last driver to win this race in the pole. He started there last year and he won. Prior to that, David Pearson was the most recent pole setter to go ahead and win the Southern 500. Harry didn't start in the pole this time. He started in six. Bill Elliott owned the number one spot after qualifying. You know, we talked about the fact that maybe, and I repeat, maybe Harry Gant could go the distance because he's always gotten such good fuel mileage. That's really going to be running it close to the vest, though. On the restart there, I believe they had about 130 miles to go in this event. And that would have to really call for some excellent fuel consumption. That would be a Doug Henning miracle. No question about it. If he could wave the magic wand and go 130 miles, even if they were 20 or 30 miles under the yellow flag. Well, Dick Bergman is down in the pit area, and something has begun to develop in the Joe Rutman Folgers coffee pit. Dick? Thanks, Larry. I really wish we had Jack Aroot here because this is a Jack problem. What apparently happened is Joe ran over his good Jack when he made his last pit stop. And what they're, he bet it so badly that they've, they're going to do something and they're cannibalizing a couple of Jacks trying to get one good one that's going to work for him. Meanwhile, there's other things going on in the pit. Jerry Punch has those stories. Here in the Darrell Ultra pits, here's the reason for the Walter fire. The caliper, a part of the brake assembly from the left front tire, had broken loose. You see where the brackets had broken along here? This began to hang down. It began to rub along the wheel assembly. It caught it on fire. It totally destroyed the brakes. These are the brake pads inside of the left front disc brake. They had to tear this off, cut the cables, replace it. While they replaced it, fluid leaked out of this brake fluid cable and caught on fire. That was the fire on Darrell Waltrip's car, the left front tire. Darrell Waltrip has returned back to the speedway. He's out running now, but several laps in the rears to not only this man, but three other people who are on the lead lap. Darlington International Raceway. The straightaways are 1,300 feet in length. That's exactly one quarter of a mile where Harry Gann is right now on the front stretch. He goes to turns one and two. Their radius is 2,100 feet. They're a little more narrow than turns three and four. Turns three and four are 2,500 feet around, and lots of smoke now from Dale Earnhardt's car, and I don't think that's just tire smoke. Boy, that time by it didn't look like tire smoke, Larry, but it's so hard to tell because you could have gotten it off the right front tire, especially if you've got a push, and it would come under the undercarriage and come out in what one would begin to think might have been a rear end or something more terminal happening. Now, the yellow flag may be coming out here. We've got debris on the back stretch. The yellow flag comes out now. This could be interesting. It's time to play all your cards up, Larry. They can go the distance from here. This is when these pit crews are going to have to choose their best tires, make the final adjustment, and gamble that this thing's going to go green the rest of the while. And it's going to tighten the field up. Now let's watch how well Bill Elliott runs. Now we'll see what we will see. Exactly 100 miles to go, 74 laps left in this race. Everybody now has a chance to come in, put on that best set of tires put in enough fuel to go the distance, which will probably be a full load for everybody. There you see Gant coming in, Earnhardt shooting underneath him, Harry sleeping perhaps just a bit that time. There's the debris on the racetrack, looks like just a paper bag. Down there right in the middle of the groove though on the back stretch, and Dick Bergeron is down in Harry Gant's pit, ready to call the action. And enthusiastically, Harry Gant overshot his pit ever so slightly. They're ready for him though. Left side tires is Harry Gant's choice, and they pretty well got them on now. He's got a black tire mark on the left. Jerry Punch. Dale Earnhardt in, likewise in for a pit stop with left side tires on Earnhardt's car. He also got left side tires. We'll try to get a comment from Richard Tillers. Richard, is there a problem with the car? Is the car smoking on the racetrack? What? Is the car smoking on the racetrack a little bit? No, we're just now starting to have to use sticker tires, and we think it's a tire smoking right now. We couldn't really tell. Well, that's a story from the Earnhardt pit. Possibly tire smoke only. Could be good afternoon for Earnhardt. Left side tires on the pit stop. Yes, Bill Elliott did pit. Yes, Cale Yarbrough pitted. We were not watching Cale, but Bill changed left side tires. Left sides across the board, Larry, so everybody's pretty much got the same on board. Four guys are in it. We've got 100 miles to go. This could be a quartet-type shootout, an OK, OK Corral shootout to the finish of this year's Southern 500 at Darlington.
Larry Newber, Jack Arud, and down in the pits, Dick Bergren and Dr. Jerry Punch down in the pit area. This year's running of the Southern 500. What you're looking at right now is Cale Yarborough in the Hardy's orange on the inside and the Wrangler blue and yellow of Dale Earnhardt on the outside, and they both think they are the lead car in this race, and uh, negotiations are going on right now, even as we speak. Larry, here's how that un unfolded. Cale Yarbrough is the only one of the lead cars that pits on the backstretch. So when that caution came out, there's Waddell Wilson checking out with NASCAR officials about it. There's the backstretch pits. He ducked in, took advantage of that, and was out back before the rest of the competitors could hit their pits on the front stretch, and he inherited the lead. Another thing to remember is no time ever in Cale Yarbrough's career has he ever had to pit on the back stretch. And he said to me before the start of the race, if I should win this one from the back pits, <laughs> you, I'll guarantee I'll be back there I'll every back race. Here from now on. And another thing we were talking about last night, Jack, in one of the meetings that we had, when Cale Yarbrough is near the front or on the lead lap with maybe 50, 75 miles to go, he's really tough to bet against. And uh, he's uh, close to that right now. He is the toughest gentleman in motorsports racing. There's no question about that, whether it's Indy cars or stock cars, and he's driven both. When you put it down time for the money, Cale Yarbrough just goes for it. And that Rainier Lundy racing team desperately wants to win this Southern 500. I can guarantee you that. You saw the Rebel fly flag go by appropriately enough here at the Southern 500 inside the 100 mile mark to go Yarborough leads remember they have struggled with engines all of 1985 Dale Earnhardt runs in second he's feeling very racy red hot right now Harry Gann is there and Bill Elliott who has not dropped out of a race because of an engine problem since 1983 right there and lest we forget let's uh, let's look at the fact that Cale Yarborough started his Hardy Sport back in 22nd position they had a problem in qualifying and they had a coil go bad, so they had to qualify on the second day. There's Joe Rutman getting some service as we're getting down, almost ready to restart this thing. Looks like Lake Speed is out of his race car for the second week in a row, Larry. As we watch Lake Speed uh, apparently getting ready for a driver change, Jack, you were mentioning about Kale's starting position. Nobody has won this race since 1954 who started this race 20th position on back. Back in 1954, Buck Baker started 23rd and won the race. But since that time, the worst starting position of any winner was Neil Bonnet a couple years ago when he started 14th. Another that thing that, story. excuse me, another thing that Waddell Wilson will have to contend with very quickly is Cale is not getting the best fuel mileage of everybody. He only went 57 laps between pit stops the last time. Everybody else went 70 or so. 57 laps, 60 laps would not be enough. And anticipating green flag this time around, Terry Labonte brings the inside row around. He is laps down. Cale Yarborough, Dale Earnhardt, Harry Gant, and Bill Elliott, the man who still has a shot to pass go and earn one million bonus dollars, comprise the first four of the Southern 500 is back under green flag. Bonnie and Earnhardt make contact hard in turn one and two, but they both gather it back up and continue. But that drops Earnhardt off the blistering pace set by your leader on the restart, Cale Yarbrough. That was costly. It hurts Earnhardt, it hurts Gann, and also hurts Bill Elliott as Cale Yarbrough suddenly has about a football field or two between himself and the entire rest of the field. They got a good break on the traffic there. If you watch that restart, some of the other front runners were trying to weed their way through the traffic. Jack, let me interrupt you. Harry Gann has dropped off the pace significantly. Harry Gann is almost at the tail of the line. He stays in fourth position, and heavy smoke definitely coming out from underneath Harry Gant's car. Yeah, it was coming out of the headers, especially in the corners when the oil gets up there on the side of the pan, so it looks like there is a problem on that car. We were just complimenting Harry Gant and the engine department that they have done so well in the last couple of years. We felt that his fuel mileage would be an advantage, but right now they are in deep trouble. So there were four, and it looks like now we'll be down to three, Larry, in the shootout for the million dollars in the Southern 500, depending on which side of the fence you're on. Here again, it, it, it looks like he's not going to be in the hunt. Gail Yarbrough is now tearing into turn number three. Now Earnhardt enters turn three. There's Kale about 200 yards ahead of Dale. Smoke continues to come from underneath the number three Wrangler machine. Is it tires? Is it engine? It's been now wisping for about 25 laps, so beginning. And Bobby Hillen touches the wall coming out of turn number four. Anxious moments for that young driver. I think he got away with it. Boy, did he scoot up there close and probably banged it just a touch. 
Larry, if it was anything other than tire smoke, by now one of two things would have happened. The engine would have expired, or NASCAR would have called him in for a consultation. So my calculated guess right now is that it's just indeed tire smoke. And Dale Earnhardt would get another team's tires, at least on the inside. Remember earlier this race, they were painted a different color, but uh, now they're black. Yarborough, the Hardys orange and white, going by. Watch for the Wrangler blue and yellow. There it is at the bottom of your screen, Earnhardt, with that smoke continuing to pour from underneath the race car. Earnhardt holds about a football field advantage over the third running Bill Elliott. There's Bill down the back stretch in the Steelers number nine, the upside down number on the roof of that car. Beginning to wonder, can Bill do it? Bill Elliott, it gets closer and closer to his chance for the one million, and Jerry punches with leg speed. Well, an exhausted Lake Speed has climbed out of his Pontiac and sort of lies here on pit road trying to get pulled off. But Lake, first of all, I know you're totally exhausted to be climbing out of the car. You don't like to do that. No, it's very disappointing. You know, people in Nationwide have been so good and the guys work on the car so hard, it's just hard to be the weak link. I don't know. You're the doctor and tell me. Maybe I got a bug or something for to strike me down like this two weekends in a row. First time in five years. Well, there's been a lot of flu going around. Who got in the car? Dave Marcus, I think. Well, we won't make Lake talk too much. He looks totally exhausted. He got out last week at Bristol, wasn't feeling very well. He got sick in this race, had to climb out. They put Dave Marcus, one of the veteran drivers, in his car. Well, the reference there to Jerry Punch, he is an MD. He works in an emergency room down in Daytona Beach, and we believe that for the first time in the history of broadcasting, we have two doctors working the pits. Dr. Dick Bergram has a PhD in psychology of all things, and boy, he needs it down on pit road. Turn number four, Yarbrough with Bob Earnhardt. There goes Elliott. Quite a tussle going on for fourth position on back in the track. That's Jeff Bodine right now that leads that pack. Bodine is in fifth position. Gann has stayed out, runs in fourth position, but way at the tail of the lead pack. Bodine is fifth. Buddy Baker is sixth, one lap down. Ron Bouchard is seventh. There's Elliott again. Ricky Rudd still only one lap down in eighth. Ninth, two laps in arrears is Terry Labonte. Benny Parsons is 10th. And 12th is Neil. Make that 11th is car number 12, Neil Bonnet. Has Elliott begun to sense maybe a problem on car number three? Because it looks like he's closing in. But there's the battle for that position between, between Jeff Bodine and then Terry Labonte. And Neil Bonnet gets around Labonte and gathers up another spot. Now, Tim Richmond is not in the hunt for racing for that position. He's just actually in that cluster of cars right now. But they've really been going at it, I'll tell you. There's Bonnet signaling to Terry Labonte saying, hey, thanks, I think you just got me through that one. As they go down the back stretch, looking now at Tim Richmond, there's Bonnet, then Labonte. 307 laps complete. Remember, this race will be 367 laps, so it gets closer and closer for Bill Elliott. The tension builds. Can he win it? Jack, the drama is beginning to build. There was definitely smoke coming from underneath Cale Yarborough's car in the last lap. Dale Earnhardt almost lost control coming out of turn number two. He was passed once by Elliott, but he got him back. Now, is Yarborough smoke? Is that oil or is it tires? Both cars running in front of the million-dollar man, Bill Elliott, are smoking. Let's take a look at the last lap pass. Here comes Dave, Bill Elliott. He sensed, as we said, maybe a problem on Earnhardt's car. He gave it a shot for position. He goes up into the corner cleanly by a nice pass. And let's get an update from Dick Bergeron to see just if there is indeed a problem on Dale Earnhardt's car. Dick? Well, if there is a problem on if there is a problem on Dale Earnhardt's car, Richard Childress, who owns it, will know. Richard, what's the story? Well, we're picking up a little bit of smoke in the corner, but I think we're under that last caution. He must something must have come up and hit a line or something. It's not anything serious though. Is it rear end, engine, transmission? What is it? And will the car last the duration? Yeah, the car will last if NASCAR don't get a, you know, say something about it. They're going to work with us as long as it don't get no worse. So as long as there's no oil problem on the racetrack, they're going to let you stay out there and you're going to have tough. Yeah, the car, it ain't affecting the car any. Larry? Well, Dick, a roar went up from the crowd when Elliott went underneath Dale Earnhardt. They all stood up. They sensed the clutching blow or the killing blow coming.
coming up, but it doesn't seem to be happening. You know, Richard Childers may have really severely understated that because, you know, of course, Elliott got around to Earnhardt, and if the smoke was affecting Earnhardt's uh, capacity to drive here, he would have never been able to get back around Elliott as easily as he did. So it's probably one of those small lines that go back somewhere, maybe to a breather or something like that, that might have become severed from some debris. And what's nice is NASCAR will indeed work with you in that situation. They'll stay in close contact with Childress and with their turn viewers and make sure that it isn't laying down any liquid on the racetrack that could pose a hazard for other drivers. Time is beginning to run out for Bill Elliott. Yarborough is about 25 car lengths ahead of Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt is about eight car lengths ahead of Bill Elliott. 52 laps remain in this race. 52 laps is about 70 miles. 70 miles out of 500. Bill Elliott, the only man with a chance for the Winston Million, is still very much in the thick of it. He has more than a chance. He is right up there, Jerry. Hey, Gail Yarbrough's got a chance to make $40,000 this afternoon. That's not too bad of a payday either. So you can be sure that he and Dale Earnhardt is running in the second position. They're all going for bucks. Maybe a few less zeros than Bill Elliott, but they're running just as hard. That money's important to them, too. There is a visible difference. It's shorter between first and second spot. Earnhardt is definitely winning in Yarbrough. There goes Yarbrough. Earnhardt. Here comes Elliott. The first three positions have visually tightened up over the last three laps. Earnhardt is now coming on like a rocket ship. That distance, which was 30 cars, is now shrunk to about 15. And I still contend there is smoke coming from both of the cars in front of Bill Elliott. That smoke is so difficult, though, to tell just indeed if it's affecting performance on these machines. You know, when you run 500 miles, so many little pieces and parts can come loose, and you can begin to have some liquid spill out from so many various and sundry places under the race car. And right now, look at Earnhardt. He is just closing the margin between he and the leader, Cale Yarbrough. This battle is going to go right down to the wire. Cale Yarbrough, who dropped out of the Michigan race after winning at Talladega, and if we've got to spin and turn number two, it's Earnhardt. And right in front of Elliott, and Elliott misses him. Boy, that was close. Bill Elliott almost saw the $1 million go away on the backstretch. Wow. Whoa. Yellow flag will come out. Earnhardt with damage to the front end. It finally caught up with him, and this will move Bill Elliott right to the back bumper of Cale Yarborough. Is this the chance that he's been waiting for? Let's take a look at this. Dale Earnhardt very loose in the corner. You can see it begin to break traction. It starts to come around on him. He just doesn't have the opportunity to get it straightened back up. He's got full lock on the brakes. Does one 360. He still hasn't let loose of the brakes. There he does now. He's clipped the wall, however. Locks him back up again. Wow. Uh -oh. Boy, Elliott came close. Well, Bill Elliott made the right decision. Normally, Jack, a race driver will point at where a car is because he thinks that's his best shot. And if a car is sliding, I go at him where he is right now. He'll be gone when I get there. But no, Bill Elliott elected to go to the low side. Watch Elliott come into your picture. Down low, sneaks by him, almost gets clipped on a rear bumper, but he doesn't. And he's coming in for a pit stop. So Bill Elliott is making a change. They're going to the right side tires this time. Remember the last time he changed the left side rubber. He and Cale Yarborough, along with Gary Gann, who is limping, will be the only three cars on the lead lap. So this will not hurt Bill's position on the racetrack. Let's go down to Dick Berger and for a report on Dale Earnhardt's pit. Well, they are working absolutely feverishly on the front end, or at least they were. Dale just blew out of here in order to avoid getting left, and it's almost certain he's going to have to come back in again. The front end is reasonably bashed, but not in terrible shape, and the front end may not be misaligned. Well, you just had the feeling that Dale Earnhardt had been carrying a limping race car, so to speak, for the last 50, 75 laps, and finally had caught up with it. But now the adversaries become less and less. Bill Elliott has a bigger chance. Here comes Gale. Gale goes down to the inside. Does he have enough room into three? Yes, he's clear. Back up into the groove. But look at Elliott. Elliott dips downstairs. He says, nothing doing, Gale. I want the spot back. Not enough. Yarborough sideways off of turn number four. Elliott is right on his back bumper. There is Jeff Bodine in the white and yellow number five. Bodine running fourth position in the race. 
heavy duty smoke coming out looked like from Bodine that time, but that definitely looked like tires. But boy, here's the contest up front for the front position in the 36th annual Southern 500. Yarborough trying to play the rabbit. Bill Elliott playing the hound. He's got a million dollars up for grabs and one guy from nearby Sardis. And oh no, an engine. It looks like it's gone away on Cale Yarborough. And look at Elliott go down on the apron trying to get around. Bill Elliott with some very anxious moments. Fortunately for him, the entire field behind him senses the situation and let him go. Bill Elliott once again averts disaster by mere inches. The 36th annual Southern 500. This all began back in 1950 when they constructed almost an oval around an old minnow pond and they've been racing here ever since those days. The top six, Elliott, Yarborough, and Earnhardt. 334 of 367 laps complete. Bodine on the lead lap, followed by Buddy Baker in fifth and Ricky Rudd in sixth. That duo is one lap down. If Bill Elliott has any butterflies, they'll quickly turn to bullets inside his stomach because he looks in his rearview mirror and there's Cale Yarbrough and Jeff Bodine, both of them on the lead lap as we're getting ready to go back to green one more time. If any race driver could handle this type of very nervous potentially situation, it would be the very cool, calm, and collective little southern boy, Austin Bill in Dawson Hill. on the drop of a green flag. He's able to get around that lap car and break for daylight quicker than the guy that's running second. That's what happened to Cale Yarbrough. Yarbrough, real loose, almost kisses the concrete. No problems on that Hardy Sports Thunderbird. I think the only threat, and it's just a, an opinion at this point, to Bill Elliott's supremacy for the last stages of this race would be potentially from Jeff Bodine. And Bodine right now has about four cars and over 13,000 pounds of iron between himself and that guy in the red car right there, the number nine. But Larry, look how quick things have changed so dramatically over the last 40 or 50 laps. This racetrack, they call it too tough to tame. It'll turn around and bite you at any moment. It happened to Cale Yarbrough. And you can be sure Bill Elliott realizes that, and he's gonna do like Yogi Berra and say, it ain't over till it's over. Bill Elliott cruises through turns three and four. That's Buddy Baker right behind him. Buddy is well up in the top ten. He's had a great day. Baker is running in sixth. Make that fifth position right now. Yellow flag is out. Our guess is oil in the first corner. Harry Gann has been emitting more and more smoke or steam each passing lap. I can see it in the sunshine. There's definitely oil right up in the high groove. If there were two grooves here in Darlington going through one and two. This could be a relatively lengthy caution flag. I can see three or four laps of uh, yellow flag conditions for this one because there's oil right up along the uh, wall. So we watch Harry Gant make his way to the pits one more time. They'll probably try to continue their ongoing effort to make repairs. No, they won't. He's finally said, that's it, tooth for knee. I'm going to the garage area. And the report we're getting is that it was the 33's oil. Here comes million dollar bill. Well, in a few laps, he may become million dollar bill. But you can be sure that Larry, I don't care how poised you are, you've got to be thinking about that inside the race car right now. You know, now. Jack, I think that's a very good point. We've talked many times that when you're leading a race and you're this close to the finish and there are these little nagging caution flags, one right after the other, is it going to bother you? You're going to think about it as a race driver? We always say, no, the answer is no. You've reached this plateau in your career. You're a Grand National Stock Car driver. This is relatively routine. You're going to take it in stride and not even think about it. But it's got to be different. Let's, Bill take, Elliott. let's give some recognition to the guys that are on the Crewers Melling crew. Harry Melling, of course, the owner. George Elliott, the team manager. That's his dad. Ernie Elliott, the crew chief. Dan Elliott, the other brother, runs the tires. Mike Brandt, Clinton Chumley, Nick Gazaway, Chuck Hill, Steve Reagan, Butch Stevens. There's other guys on that crew that do it day in and day out and every Sunday afternoon, giving Bill Elliott the most incredible racing year that any drivers had in a long time. And the interesting thing about a lot of those crew members when it all began back seven, eight years ago, a lot of them were volunteer. They decided just to stay with it. They thought they had a comfortable situation, a potentially winning team, and it has really paid off for them in 1985. They are on the brink of that million dollar bill. Is that the letter E on the roof of Bill Elliott's car? Does that stand for hurricane? Bill Elliott, Elliott, Yarborough, Bodine, the first three after 339 laps. They go by very slowly after all these yellow flags. Fourth through sixth are the number three car of Dale Earnhardt, Buddy Baker in fifth, and Ron Bouchard is in sixth position, and Ricky Rudd is also right there in seventh on the same lap, one lap down with uh, Bouchard. 
Larry, you can't help but get excited right now because you feel like you may have the opportunity to witness history. It's kind of reminiscent to me, and this isn't stretching the point at all, of the day we watched on television a man step on the moon for the first time. We said, boy, I was there, I saw it. And it, it, that's the feeling that we're beginning to sense here with this crowd of almost 80,000 people. They're really pushing for Bill Elliott to scorch this racetrack and gather in a $1 million bonus from R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company and be able to say 20 or 30 years from now, yeah, I was there. I was there the day while Bill Elliott took home the yeah. million. You know, Jack, uh, oftentimes broadcast journalists criticize, get criticized for maybe being just a little too flamboyant on the air. But should Bill Elliott win this race, I firmly believe this is a candidate for the biggest automobile racing story of the century. Look at the windshield and the hood is gone on Tim Richmond's car. Now, how do you look out that thing? That's got more spider webs on it than an old barn. Green flag. 341 laps complete. 367 laps make up the Southern 500. 26 laps to go. Boy, it's almost like watching poetry in motion. Look at all the smoke from all the cars out there that are the walking wounded. Ron Bouchard slides up out of the groove. There's smoke from him. Still smoke coming from Earnhardt's car, Yarborough's car. Boy, watch Yarborough. Let's see if he has the metal to wrestle that car like a grizzly bear and go after Bill Elliott. He seems to be losing a little bit of an advantage going down in the corner. But well, I'll tell you what, Kale Yarborough is tough to do battle here at Darlington without benefit of power steel. Poetry in motion from our highly positioned cameras here above the one and three eighths mile oval at the Darlington International Raceway. They're still knocking off laps well above 150 miles an hour, particularly the leader, Bill Elliott. And Yarborough is not making it easy. He's staying with Bill Elliott, and there is no, ch no chance to breathe for this young man from Georgia. Well, Bill Elliott seems to have everything well in hand at the present time, and there's a few drivers that are still out there in competition that have done yeoman's work today, and although they haven't been in the front of the hunt, it's good to see them back, namely Ken Reagan and Kenny Schrader. You know, Schrader has survived this Darlington battle, and he's a rookie in competition today in Judy Dunleavy's car. There it is, the ultra-sealed Ford. Schrader of open cockpit fame, continuing to pursue the learning curve this year, and watch out for him next year once he's got a full year of competition under his belt. He'll hear him come knocking. Well, dirt track racing is very demanding, and Schrader, of course, a lot of experience on that, so as he stays out there on this tough racetrack, he cements his lead in the rookie standings as Eddie Birchwell dropped out a little earlier, so Schrader out there going to school today. There's Elliott down the back stretch. There is Yarbrough, second on the track and second in the race. Bodine is on the lead lap, he runs in third. Dale Earnhardt, despite all of his problems and that hair-raising spin coming out of turn number two, right now is still on the lead lap. Richard Petty is among those drivers who have lasted today. Richard Petty is showing his medal as he has stayed out there, never running with the lead pack. He stayed on the lead lap for quite a while today, the first 100 laps or so of this race. Then it began to catch up with him. He dropped back, but he's been able to stay out on the track. And for Richard, who has all, had all kinds of problems this year, that is somewhat of a minor victory. We watched Cale Yarbrough in that up-close shot coming out of turn two. You can see that he doesn't seem to be having too much difficulty wrestling with that race car, even though the power steering is out. But in a comparison to Bill Elliott, the way Elliott goes through the corners, Elliott's car is still much more stable than Harry Renier, J.T. Lundy's own car, the Cale Yarbrough pilots. Now, one factor, one key factor in Bill Elliott's success has been their ability to finish races. In 1983, he dropped out only four times in 30 events. In 84, twice in 30 races. He's had two DNFs in 1985, and none of them have been because of mechanical problems. Knocked out both times by an accident. It's so great to see Bill Elliott running up front the way he is, because there was not that many years ago, Larry, when that team almost folded. If it were not for Harry Melling coming to their rescue, George Elliott has said repeatedly he would have had to close up shop, tell Ernie and Dan and Bill Elliott to go look for employment somewhere else that he just couldn't pay the bills anymore. Enter Harry Melling from Jackson, Michigan. He said, look, I'll buy the race team, I'll fund you. And then a year later, lo and behold, here comes the Adolph Coors Company. They lend some sponsorship. And now 
now they're on the brink of dominating 1986 like no one, I mean 1985 like no one has before them. You're probably right, the way things are going, this could easily carry over to next season. 1986 might be more of the same. 25 miles, not laps, 25 miles to go. Bill Elliott continues to hold on tenaciously. Yarborough will not let him get away easily. Yarborough wrestling that grizzly bear around the Darlington International Raceway. We've got heavy smoke in turn number three as the leaders go through one and two. And I think it's Earnhardt. Earnhardt has pulled down into the pit area. And it is Dale Earnhardt. It looks like it's all given up the ghost for him. And we're going to go down to Dick Berger, who's going to talk to actually the leader of the Elliott gang. Dick? This man is the leader indeed. He's George Elliott, Bill's dad. How do you feel at this moment, Mr. Elliott? Like it's eternity. What do you think? What do you project for the conclusion of the race? Have you got it? Uh, no, but we hope. We're still hoping. It's, it's a long way to go yet. Has the last week been difficult? Not really. It's been, the NASCAR has made every effort, and they have done a super job keeping the pressure off, and it's just been wonderful. And, and so is the team here, and right now, Jerry Punch is with Harry Gant. The one driver has certainly done a yeoman's job here today, Harry. It has to be disappointing to run so strong and then to come up short. Well, I'm tickled the car ran that good today. Uh, we've been struggling you know, for a lot of speed races. The car ran super good today. Uh, I just I just over it a little bit. I turned about 7,900 on that restart. I don't like to do that during the race, you know, because it's, uh, that's what I'm turning in the race. And I don't like to turn it anymore in second or third gear. So I guess I just broke a valve, busted a piston, and blew the oil out there and finally had to quit. But uh, car ran good. The school bandit team done. Travis Carr and all the boys done a super job setting that car up. You can run about however fast you wanted to go and just sit there and wait for stuff to happen. Just, I thought it was going to make two Southern 500s in a row. Well, Harry, it's out of it here at Darlington, but Blazingville is still going wild. Jerry, he sure is, and that's also another example of if you're home watching, there's so much more to the sport than just sitting behind the wheel and tromping the accelerator. There's so many things you can do wrong Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday there's just an entire forest of problems that face you. It's a little mountainous sometimes, Larry. It seems like you can never get caught up and things just, something that you may have done on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday may turn around and bite you, as they say, on Sunday afternoon, too. So there's no rest for the weary. There really isn't, as we heard in that special conversation between Benny Parsons and Bill Elliott earlier. Simple little things, sometimes that under normal circumstances it would be just a matter of course, but in the rush of trying to do something big, like remounting an engine, you might overlook them and it might cost you a race. 20 drivers in the history of Grand National Stock Car Racing have won $1 million in their career. Bill Elliott stands the chance to win one today. And there was Waddell Wilson. He's just looking down at the ground, hoping that Cale Yarbrough has got enough to make the pass for the lead. What about it, Cale? Do you think even though you don't have the power steering that you can make a run on Bill Elliott? Well, apparently the... Take it both hands and both arms as hard as I can... You've had a good chance to take a look at him, uh, Kale. What do you think? Does Elliott shown all that he's got, or is he holding something back? I don't know, Jackie. It's uh, taking all I can do to get my car through the turns with no power steering. It's just so hard to turn. It's taking both arms and both hands and both arms and my legs, too, to get this thing turned. So I'm just trying to hang on now. No way I can beat him. Another guy who turned in a Herculean effort today was Dale Earnhardt. Looks like you probably had him covered most of the day, partner, but uh, it all came up a little bit short. Well, you know, it's Wrangler Chevrolet and General Motors Park Chevrolet is really doing the job today, and uh, I felt like Harry Gant and myself had something for Bill, but, uh, you know, when you don't finish the race, you can't race anybody, and, uh, you know, we got up a little high on that rough-ass pavement they got down there in one and two, and, uh, you know, it spun out, lost, lost traction, spun around. The racetrack's not about one group wide down there, you know, just old Dalton. The car was smoking toward the last part of the race. What was smoking? Did you have any idea? Was it the rear end? I don't want smoking on it. Uh, it just, you know, I couldn't tell. They just do it in the corner. And the, I'd say the car worked good, though, and, you know, Richard and the crew did a heck of a job on it. And, uh, you know, I reckon the driver made a mistake. With you and Harry out, can anyone handle Bill now out there? No, he's riding. That sums it up from Dale Earnhardt.
Well, perhaps this will be the last time to give you a rundown on most of the cars that are still out on the racetrack. Heads up for your favorite driver. We've mentioned the first three as Elliott, Yarborough, and Bodine. Fourth, and all these cars are one lap down. Buddy Baker, Neil Bonnet in fifth, Ron Bouchard in sixth, Ricky Rudd is seventh. Two laps down in eighth position, number 44, Terry Labonte, and 55, Benny Parsons. Three laps down, Joe Rutman in 10th, Tim Richmond in 11th, Kyle Petty in 12th, Richard Petty in 13th. And five laps down in 14th position, Bobby Hillen Jr. And in 15th position, the number 90 car of the most outstanding rookie of 1985, Kenny Schrader. One more time, Larry, here we go. Let's see if Cale Yarbrough can make a liar out of us again and maybe challenge Bill Elliott. He just stays glued right behind him as they come across the stripe and into one. Now, under the circumstances, we are guessing that we may have a lot of first-time viewers, first-time fans of Grand National Stock Car Racing. And just to assure you, this is not the kind of sport where they get together and make decisions before the race starts. If there's any possibility at all of Cale Yarbrough getting around Bill Elliott, even moving up alongside of him and using strong-arm tactics like we saw last week at Bristol, it'll happen. They are not giving any quarter to the guy in the red and white. Room. Listen, these race car drivers say the green means go and the checkered means stop, and no holds barred in between. And you can be sure that if Cale Yarbrough can gather it in and make a challenge for the lead, he'll do it. But Elliott still continues to look like he's on a Sunday afternoon stroll. 367 laps will mark the final grain of sand as it drops from the top of the hourglass to the bottom. This time we are coming up on lap number 356, so just outside, 10 laps to go. No words can describe what is beginning to unfold in front of you right now. Bill Elliott with a chance that no other racing driver in the history of this sport has even ever come close to. Repeating again, not only does there, is there so much riding on this individual race, but he has won so often this year that he might accumulate $1 million in winnings outside of any bonus winnings. He could face the possibility of winning two and a half million dollars in one season behind the wheel of a race car. Let's take a look back inside of Benny Parsons' automobile. He's given us such a fine ride all afternoon. He's got to be fatigued, but he's still battling back there. And, uh, you know, it's real good to see him back in competition. Unfortunate that he hasn't won the Southern 500 here this afternoon. But, boy, he's taking us for a whale of a ride there. There you can see out the front. Now we'll go to the back and measure the competition. And there isn't much behind him. So Benny Parsons is just going to hold on for the last 11 laps. Good ride for Benny, our colleague. And believe me, it is one thing, and it can be described in two words. Hard capitalized work. Benny Parsons, motors in ninth, and that man right there in the red and white number nine, motors in first. You saw Yarbrough is still there, holding on. Tenacious Kale Yarbrough, color, carrying the colors of the Hardy's restaurant, the only restaurant that is active among the top 20, top 25 listed in point standing, sponsoring the Grand National Race Car. The beer companies, of course, have hit this sport in a very big way, but the Hardy's people carry the banner and the flag stand, really, for all the fast food restaurants in the country. Larry, you said it just a while ago. Words cannot in any way paint the picture that we're seeing on the screen. This is history in the making. Over $1 million up for grabs today. And we're going to take a look at Neil Bonnet and Buddy Baker in the meantime because they're battling for a position. Bonnet has gotten by and look down here at the start finish line. A NASCAR official ran out. And Baker is slowing all of a sudden. After a great Sunday afternoon run, Baker has got some problems. Well, there was some minor debris buddy drops out of fourth position on the front stretch maybe that came from buddy's car but wow what a disappointment for this veteran racer who was giving it one of his best rides of the 1985 season it's been a real uphill grind for this driver and his crew chief booby harrington in 1985 and they would have certainly liked to do well here a fourth place finish for them would have been almost as good as a victory because they've tried to turn this team around and it's so sad that it's fallen short by just six laps some of the past winners of the Southern 500. We mentioned a few of them earlier. Fireball Roberts, Daryl Derringer won this great race back in the, the 1960s. Larry Frank surprised a lot of the veterans when he ended up winning this race. Ned Jarrett, one of our broadcasting colleagues, has also carried the checkered flag after a Southern 500. This is one race that Richard Petty has won only once. And as I'm saying that, Drama begins to pick up just a bit. Yarborough is closing in on Bill Elliott. This time by five 
laps to go, and Yarborough is definitely moving in. You saw the open fist of Harold Kinder signifying the five to go. Yarborough digging deep down inside his gut, trying to gather it up and make one last charge on Bill Elliott. Elliott sensed it, however, Larry, and you could see. He lengthened the margin as they worked that turn one and two area. As they head to three, he has a comfortable margin with coming up on four laps to go to one million dollars. Four laps to go this time, and the crowd has already begun to cheer. We can hear them even above the roar of the engines here at this fabled old racetrack. A low roof on the front stretch grandstands, very traditional here. And when the crowd turns on, they can even drown out the sound of 20 or 25 racing engines on this racetrack. Darlington International Raceway, the site of so many historic occasions in the history of stock car racing. The NMPA Stock Car Racing Hall of Fame is housed here. And this afternoon, we may be on the brink of setting, stepping into a brand new era, a $2 million winner. Three laps to go for Bill Elliott. The 100-mile track record here was set back in 52. The 300-mile record in 64. The 400-mile record back in 1968. Cale Yarborough holds the track record for the Southern 500. Elliott may be tempting that record, but that's not important right now. It's what he has at stake in terms of winning. He must win three of the four crown jewels of stock car racing to earn the $1 million. Earnhardt is out of it. Bodine is out of it. Yarborough is still close, but Elliott has two laps to go and one victory to pick up three of those four crown jewel races. You know those butterflies that before felt like bullets? Well, you can be sure right now in the pit of Bill Elliott's stomach, they feel like anvils because he knows he's got only less than two laps to go to victory lane. Bill Elliott, the man from Georgia, the man that nobody saw coming five, six years ago. They begin to see some sparks two years ago and last year you could see that the embers were there for a great, great NASCAR career. The white flag is coming up this time around. You can see the fans urging him on. Bill Elliott has just 1.366 miles to go. Elliott around turn number one. There's Bernie Elliott, the man who makes all the decisions down in the pin area. Elliott is out of turn number two. He's down the backstretch. Bill Elliott at this historic old race plan is running in the tire tracks of people like Johnny Mance, who won the first race back in 1950 here. Bonnie Flop, Buck Baker. Bill Elliott is racing into the record books. Bill Elliott is going toward immortality. Bill Elliott gets the checkered flag. Bill Elliott has won an additional $1 million in 1985. What a moment in auto racing history. Bill Elliott has won a bonus of $1 million. He's well on the road to winning additional $1 million in race winnings alone. If he wins the points championship, that's another $275,000. What a big moment. Dick Bergen is down in the pit area right now. Ernie, it was a, a wonderful moment. How do you feel? Well, the first thing I got to do is thank the Lord. I mean, it, we weren't the best car here today, but I tell you, he really looked out for us, and he's looked out for us all year long. You know, I can't say much else than that. Other than, you know, I'd like to thank my sponsor, Coors, and you know, our car owner, Harry Melling, and you know, my wife and family that stuck behind me, you know, for so long. And, uh, you know, it's just a dream come true. Okay, Ernie's on his way to Victory Lane to collect $1 million. And we can guarantee you that this will be a Victory Lane celebration like you have never seen before. This has never happened before, and it's only fitting that we have that type of celebration about it. A big, giant celebration celebrating Bill Elliott's victory, the third in the four crown jewels of NASCAR stock car racing in 1985. There you can see Bill taking his time on buckling, savoring the win here in the 1985 Southern 500. The winner of the Winston Million, the largest single day purse in automobile racing history. He came into this race guaranteed $100,000 and the last lap was worth $900,000. I think the crowd reaction right now, Larry, says it all. They are going to man. There you see some of the 70, 80,000 strong that have gathered here at the Darlington International Raceway to join with you and to experience this moment. Hopefully many of you have this on VCRs back home because this is the kind of moment that you're going to want to share with your entire family. There he is, Bill Elliott, savoring the spoils of victory and a well-deserved victory it is. Getting into the car with Ned Jarrett, there'll be a special victory lap. 
in the pace car. They'll go down to the pit lane and stop at Red Tyler's box. And there they'll be picking up uh, Jerry Long from the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And uh, Bill French Jr. is also scheduled to uh, jump on board this special celebration going around the Darlington International Raceway. Well, there's Jerry Long. I believe Jerry's made his way into the car, the Pontiac car convertible. Well, you, this is just incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm speechless, Larry, because it's, it's just unbelievable. Truly is Jay Wells is the uh, pace car driver in this special pace car Pontiac celebration. Jay Wells, of course, an employee of NASCAR, and the crowd is, they are just really responding to this. Race. There you see a shot from the second pace car that is riding along with Bill. The shot is, you see the celebration going on, Ned Jarrett getting ready to talk to Bill. They, Hope the end of, uh, hat flies off, but that uh, is really incidental at this moment. I think you can buy another one. <laughs> I think so. And as a matter of fact, at every stop along the uh, way, there are a number of hats for him to don for all the photographers. So Bill Elliott continues to savor this special, special win in the history of automobile racing. Elliott has picked up $1 million plus in 1985. Now with this win here at the Darlington International Raceway today in the 1985 Southern 500. Well, this celebration is sure to last much longer than the traditional victory lane celebrations and we're going to give you an opportunity to listen to something that uh, they'll put together over the winter. I got my start when I was just 17. I drive in a car on my daddy's race team. A 63 fire lane got me my start. But the way the car ran, I might as well left it apart. Things got even worse in 76 with the Torino Ford couldn't be fixed, but now things are different, the crowd's roar is heard, when I pass the stand in my new Thunderbird, I'm Wild Bill Elliott, a crazy racing man, I'd like to live up to John Wayne if I can, I'm driving my best when I make them tires burn, and I still give her hell when I hit my last turn. The press thinks I'm country, and name me Huck Finn, but if Elton John's country, that's the group I'm in. I fly my own plane. When I'm in the clouds, I think how that Winston Cup would make my family proud. Wild Bill Elliott, crazy racing man. This is the scene that everybody paid to see. They had all come in hopes that Bill Elliott would win this race, a demanding contest of man and machine, and win the Winston Million. You hear the crowd responding to Bill as he motors down the front stretch for the first time in a full pass pass past the main grandstand. Larry, you know, you can talk about the four victories of A.J. Foyt at the Indianapolis 500. You can talk about the incredible wind skiing and Formula One racing by Jackie Stewart, but they seem so paltry in comparison to this afternoon for a little toe-head 29-year-old from tiny Tossinville, Georgia, who is finally going to make his way to victory lane and receive the largest single-day payday in motorsports history. You know, it was back in 1976 that he ran his very first Grand National Stock Car Race. He dropped out of that race with, ironically, a broken oil pump, and I bet that never happens again. Of course, Harry Melling, the guy who owns this team, that's one of the things that he deals with. He finished 33rd in the Carolina 500 that year, and he won $640. That certainly says a lot. $640 payday to a payday today that was one million in bonus dollars. Of course, the, on top of that, the money for winning this race alone, what he's accumulated so far in 1985 is absolutely astronomical. And the feat that he performed, you know, he cracked under the pressure and he admitted it down there in the World 600 in Charlotte, and he totally turned it all around in his last chance here at Darlington. Bill Elliott is continuing to have a lot of fun down there in Victory Lane, and Dick Bergen is right there to join in. And this is the happiest victory lane, perhaps, of all time. Bill Elliott, the Million Dollar Man, how does it feel? I don't know. I think it'll settle in sometimes next week. I can't believe it. What were you thinking on the last few laps when it came so close? I just said, keep my cool and do what I always do, and it, it worked out. What are you going to do with all this money? I have no idea. I ain't going to worry about it. You're obviously a very happy man. No doubt about it. The entire audience is standing cheering for you, Bill. How does that make you feel? Very good. I'll tell you what. I, I drove my tail off all day long. And the car just wasn't right, and things just kept happening and worked out my way. There's a, there's a gentleman right over the shoulder of you. The man is Jerry Long. He's the chief executive officer and president of the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And he's got a pretty good-sized check that I think he'd like to present to you. 
Michelin. Carlson's uh, on behalf of Winston, we want to present the greatest driver that we've seen in a long time, and we couldn't be more happy to present Awesome Bill from Dawsonville, Georgia, $1 million, and he earned every penny of it. Where's the champagne bottle? <laughs> And falling down are dollar bills, million dollar bills, apparently for Winston. Bill? I'll tell you what, I couldn't believe it. When Winston put the money out last November or December, I couldn't believe that I'd be the one that was bit, one able to get it. I'll tell you what, I can't believe it. We're just surrounded by it. This is absolute pandemonium here. The entire grandstand is still standing. Photographers are ready. The emotion of the moment is hard to describe. Mr. Long, your feelings? I think our feelings are that this is the greatest moment in sports anywhere. I think we're all, any athlete that ever went through what Bill Elliott went through and won a million dollars, nobody's ever done. And as Bill said before, there's nothing like being the first. We don't know whether it'll be a second, but we have one million dollar bill right now. And behind every successful man, there is indeed a successful woman. Martha, Bill Elliott's wife, what do you feel? It's been an awful hard year, and I kept thinking, oh, Lord, what's going to happen next? Just get this over with. And all the cautions came out, and I said, something's going to happen. I just know it is. But it didn't, and it just went our way for once. On to the championship. On to the championship. We'll try. And that is the scene in Victory Lane. Perhaps the most special moment in the history of stock car racing may be in all of racing. This very special Winner Circle interview has been brought to you by Goodyear. Goodyear tires and Goodyear service for more Goodyears in your car. We'll be back with final thoughts and the final rundown of today's Southern 500 from the Darlington International Raceway after these few words. Stay with us. This is Larry Newber back at the Darlington International Raceway where Bill Elliott has not only won this year's Southern 500, but he has won a bonus of $1 million. The race summary here after 500 miles, 367 laps, Four hours and eight minutes was the time. The average speed was not a new track record at 121 miles an hour. There were only nine leaders. I say only because oftentimes NASCAR races are much more than that. 19 lead changes, 14 caution flags for a total of 74 laps. Bill Elliott has won the Winston Million by winning this race. Cale Yarborough nurses home an alien car in second. Jeff Bodine holds on for third. Neil Bonnet, who was on the lead lap for a long time, finishes fourth. Ron Bouchard is fifth. A nice finish for that team that has worked very hard for 1985. Sixth through tenth in the race in sixth spot was Ricky Rudd. Terry Labonte was seventh. Benny Parsons was eighth. Joe Rutman was ninth. And tenth was Kyle Petty. Larry, my comment would have to be right now that he's won the million dollars, but he set one soldier down, but he's marching on through Georgia for the Winston Cup Grand National Championship.